Good morning. Thank Good morning. you. Good morning. Already Good morning. my day is off to a better start. Um, we are calling to order commission meeting at number 281 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, November 7th at 10 a.m. here in the beautiful Plainville Town Hall at 190 South Street here in Plainville. Uh, before we get started, I do want to let uh, those who are viewing today that we will not be able to provide closed caption, uh, mainly just because of a technical um, capacity issue. Uh, once we're back in, in Boston, we'll be able to uh, renew that service. So we will begin with item number two. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, in your package, you have the meeting minutes from the October 24th, 2019 Gaming Commission meeting. Uh, I'd move approval of the minutes, again, as always, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any discussion, suggested edits? Marring none. Do I have those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 5-0, thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> Moving on to our administrative update, Executive Director Bedrosian. Good morning, members of the Commission. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to update you on a few items, personnel matters, some of the, uh, some of the items uh, personnel working on, and then um, an outline of today's meeting. So on personnel matters, um, we have had some additions to our IT operations. Uh, Tamara and O'Connor has joined us as the IT operations coordinator, coordinator. Ben Bishop has come on permanently as our senior service desk specialist. In Amadeep Agnihorti, and I hope I, I per, uh, pronounce uh, Amin, he goes by Amin, I hope it's pronounced his last name correctly, has joined us as a senior systems engineer. Um, also in HR, Natasha Martin is back from leave, and she will be based in Springfield and focused on some of the HR issues with our remote employees. We sort of have, you know, we have Boston employees, and we have remote employees, all valued the same but she'll be helping with that, with those issues. Um, on some of the issues that uh, the folks are working on, just a highlight, everyone's doing great work. Um, our HR staff is working on an annual review of our employee handbook, so that is something um, that we will um, bring to the commission. Um, finance is actually, as Lance could probably tell us, is spending some time at PPC working on our annual statutory audit. Um, uh, Mr. Ziemba, who I have excused for today, and I will play the role of Mr. Ziemba a little later in the agenda, um, is working on, um, in addition to uh, always working on community mitigation, he's preparing for the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee meeting, which is scheduled Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, so uh, he's working on helping to staff that. Um, so in terms of today's meeting, first, I would like to thank uh, people from our staff, Marianne Dooley, Austin Bumpus, and Jamie Ennis. Uh, we coming, traveling as a commission down to a remote location with all our materials, making sure streaming is prepared, um, and all the logistics that go along with it may <coughs> seem easy, but it's not, and those people deserve a lot of thanks and credit from us. So. Um, then about today's meeting, you'll see it is uh, uh, broken up maybe into two sections along with the uh, quarterly report from our, our licensee at PPC. We have a, a number of racing items in the morning and uh, regulations and research responsible gaming in the afternoon. Um, we intentionally put racing in the morning so they could actually go and conduct racing in the afternoon, which they have, and I think it's a, is it a one o'clock start? Yes. It's a one o'clock start, so um, we're gonna just be cautious of that. Uh, I anticipate um, potentially for those watching um, that the commission may take a break for lunch after item five. So that would then put us on items six, seven, eight, and nine for the afternoon. Um, so that is my administrative update. Any questions for Ed? Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Now playing the role is John Ziemba. Um, 
it is uh, our quarterly responsibility to get a uh, report from our licensees. Today, uh, Lance George, general manager at Planters Park Casino, will introduce his team for his quarterly report. Lance. Thank you. Great to be here. With me today, I have Dana Fortney, our Vice President of Finance, and Mike Mueller, Vice President of Operations. We will jump right in. Let's see. Oh, perfect. Start with, uh, with revenue and taxes paid. Several comparisons here, and in some, a look at the preceding seven quarters. For Q3 of 2019, revenues eclipsing 36 million and total taxes paid approaching 18 million. Year-over-year -year comparison for the third quarter shows a decline of approximately 8.7 million in revenue, driven primarily by the opening of Encore Boston Harbor. To date, the impact of Encore has been more significant than anticipated. However, even with that solid performance with a win per unit of $314. And we also recognize that Q3 <coughs> represents only the first three months for our new competition. As we've discussed in previous presentations, the property has always anticipated this opening and the greater than expected impact to revenues does not materially change our operation. Next slide is lottery sales. Again, a lot of numbers here. However, I'll draw your attention to just a few. Consistent with property revenues, lottery sales saw a decline. Sales down approximately 80,000 or 8.65%. Q3 2019 total sales of over 850,000. And not surprisingly, we anticipate going forward that these numbers will roughly flow with gaming revenues. Uh, solid numbers, encouraging results, nothing material and no material changes to the lottery operation for us. With that, I'll turn it over to Dana. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I'll start with our Q3 spend by state. For the third quarter, in-state spend was 873,000 or 56% of qualified spend, which is a 3% improvement from second quarter's 53%. The remaining spend is split amongst the states on the right. The overall qualified spend from the second quarter of 132,000 is applicable to the timing of payment of our larger capital related projects. Moving on to local spend, in-state versus host and surrounding community qualified spend shows a slight increase in community spend <coughs> quarter over quarter. The second quarter came in at 77,000 versus the third quarter of 103,000. The increase in local spend came from Mansfield from a vendor named Matt Graphics. They completed the banners and indoor signage around the property when we transitioned our loyalty program to My Choice over the summer. In-state spend has maintained levels similar to previous quarters in the year. I just, I just want to thank you. I know after getting your, your uh, second quarter report, I'd raised some concerns about difference differences with your track record in terms of Massachusetts spend, but I do want to thank you. We had a meeting down uh, with Lance and his team. We talked about kind of what one of the key drivers to that differential was, certainly understand, uh, but certainly remain convinced that you are constantly on the lookout for vendor opportunities and sharings. And we talked about what some of those additional opportunities were in trying to find a mass source for those. So just to follow up, on uh, kind of the post second quarter report that we had talked about. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do continue to focus on that. The procurement team has taken some of the recommendations that Joe had and will continue to look for more. Sure. Thank you. For vendor diversity, we continue to be pleased, like I said, with the efforts made by our procurement team on the diversity goals. Year-over-year -year diverse spend for the quarter came in at 30% overall on a goal of 21% and a prior year of 27%. Taking a look at the breakdown, you'll note a large jump in MEBI spend for the quarter, driven primarily by an increase in our spend with an IT equipment supplier, Millennium Information Technology. We continue with the success story looking at diverse spend from second quarter to third quarter. The decline in Weeby spend is 63,000 due to the property's transition from Liberty Creative Solutions, their marketing direct mail company, to a company called Maple Direct. Although it's impacting our third quarter numbers, we're optimistic in recovering the spend as Maple Direct is both a Meebie and a Weeby. We're just awaiting their certification before we include them in our report. On to employment. 
At the end of September, we had 454 employees with 301 or 66% of them being full-time, 143 or 32% being part-time and 10 being seasonal. Our seasonal employment's related to our racing operation. On our diversity goals, we see continue, continued success in our diversity and veteran employment figures while we keep focused on our in-state and local hiring. Just a, just a note about employment, because I always like to, when I see your employment report, then go to your website for your job postings. You have about 20 to 25 job postings mm -hmm. available, at least as of last night. That might have changed. Um, but um, I'm going to have a conversation with Director Griffin and I think your team, because I think where a new opportunity might exist is now that commuter rail service is extended down to Foxborough, uh, you might have the ability to actually attract potential job candidates from up the commuter line sure. um, down to Foxborough. So I think it'd be a good conversation to have to see how we could work with some of our uh, sister agencies to get the word out about job opportunities that folks closer to Boston may not have been thinking about prior to that commuter rail service. So. Definitely. Mm -hmm. On to compliance. In Q3, our security team checked just shy of 17,000 IDs. They turned away a total of 446 individuals, of which 45 were minors, 96 were underage, and 305 had expired invalid or no ID. We did have two incidents regarding underage for the quarter. Both gained access to the gaming floor, one of which did game. However, he only inserted a total of $10 into slot machines before he was identified by security and promptly removed from the gaming floor. The other was identified by player services before gaming and was escorted from the floor. Neither individual consumed alcohol. Mm -hmm. Lastly, for compliance, the, the Mass DOT's traffic, traffic monitoring program was released on September 26, 2019. The study's conclusion is that the measured impact on traffic volumes, trip patterns, motor vehicle crash trends, and traffic operations has been relatively minor, with operating conditions at the monitored intersections found to be similar to the conditions that were documented in the 2015 baseline study. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Take a moment to jump in here for uh, public transportation and a GATRA update that we committed to providing each quarter. Um, continue to meet. We, the last meeting we had was on 1028, so a week and a half ago or so. As far as current steps or, or current status, next steps, um, they will be revising and providing a new route for review and consideration for a myriad of reasons the route that was provided previously didn't work necessarily for us or for them and so uh, we look forward to receiving a revised I or their ideas on what a new route could potentially look like no major hurdles or stumbling blocks just agreeing on what the route will be um, we should have that revision this week or next week it shouldn't be that long and remind me, Lance, the, it's uh, the route to extend the bus service that goes to Patriot Place? So I think there are a, a variety of different buses. ideas that, yeah. that could be implemented. Um, I don't know that that's where they are right now. It's kind of in their court to come back to us. Uh -huh. But the last one we saw was more of a route between Attleboro all the way up to us. It did not involve Patriot Place at that time. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, was, was that the only... Um, to do, if you will, uh, relative to the um, the study that you just mentioned? It is, yes. Yeah, as we think about relicensing too quickly from now, what, eight months from now, certainly uh, we're moving furiously. We want to get this accomplished. We'd love to have it implemented or agreed to by the end of this year. But uh, as I think about June of next year, that's something we want implemented prior to that. Mm -hmm. Moving to an update on our Women Leading at Penn program. Over the summer, we read the book You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. The book had a great focus on developing your confidence by identifying common problems that people encounter and giving you a way to face that problem head on. I really enjoy the excerpt from the book that's on the slide, especially the part about the more you push yourself to do the things that you're scared to do, the stronger your confidence will be in the future. Uh, in our next meeting in the fourth quarter, we'll be recapping the book with our group and our additional topic is navigating the workforce, which is a module that will focus on gender bias in the workplace and, and how to uh, work through those hurdles. Quick question about this program. So you had success last year, the first year of the program, and I saw the numbers um, 
uh, eight of the 16, so half of those women uh, were promoted, which is tremendous. Um, is that word getting out that, hey, this is a great program, it could help you? I mean, are women interested in this program? They are. We try to keep it at a relatively manageable size, mm -hmm. and then as, as women get promoted and move to other properties, we're replacing them. And there, there is questions that I get usually every month or so about, is there another opening? Is, oh, good. Are we able to join? Great. So, Thanks. Uh, with that, though, another success story of the group from 2018. We had another promotion in the third quarter. Uh, Chelsea Marinucci, the property's uh, revenue audit manager, accepted a position at a larger property with a broader set of responsibilities. She was one of my direct reports. Wow. Uh, so I'm very proud of her and her development. Uh, she started as a revenue auditor at opening and then received multiple promotions through her time there. Uh, so I'm really genuinely excited to see what she does, what her future looks like, and, and how she grows her career. Um, the only downside I've heard from her is that it's already been snowing in Colorado. Oh. That wasn't exactly exciting <laughs> for her, but we are very, very happy for her. Right. And are the women, they, they understand this is a real opportunity, even though they may have to move. They, they, that's not a, uh, any kind of a, um, of a barrier? It, I would say it's for some they prefer to stay and that's okay for others we have the conversation where if, if this is what you'd like to do with your future and your career moving may be a, a real reality for them in the future and we just talk about it a handful of us have moved multiple times and so can lend some guidance on that so you're being a good mentor it sounds like doing our best okay great thank you moving on to mike Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. In looking at the marketing section, Plain Ridge Park continues to be a valued partner with our local host communities, as we supported many local events this year. We were a top donator for the Amer American Cancer Society's Relay for Life, where we had many employees participate. Two employee events we conducted this year to raise money were a $5 jeans day, where you could donate $5 and wear jeans all day on Friday. And we also had several cook-off contests throughout the year where everybody would bring in their food and then you would pay, ticket, uh, pay a small fee to get a ticket to eat some of the food there and then judge and we'd have winners. So that raised a lot of money for us. We also had great guest participation through our donation boxes located on the floor. Uh, this allowed our guests to donate their low-value Tito tickets to the cause as they exited the casino. Uh, Year-to-date 2019, we raised a total of $24,900. Uh, that included $6,300 from our employee events and another $5,300 from the drop boxes from the guests. Another great event uh, we did supported the Friends of North Attleboro Animal Shelter. Uh, this event used guests and employee donations to help stock the shelves at local animal shelters. And we also made financial donations to Fun Entertainment and to the Plainville Permanent Firefighters IAFF Local 3415 here. Finally, as you can see uh, on this page, we do continue to support local community initiatives by donating to and participating in the Taste of Tritown. This is a local food festival through the Tritown Chamber of Commerce that benefits local food pantries in Foxboro, Mansfield, and Norton. Mike, I just I want to point out that this is an important slide uh, when we think about the contributions that the uh, our licensees make as corporate citizens. Uh, you know, we recognize that in so many ways in terms of the broad impacts that the that uh, PPC provides for Plainville here. But the fact that your employees are also giving back on an individual basis is significant. Uh, it it's, shows that they understand in so many ways the opportunities that that PPC is providing and that they are invested in helping. So really a credit to each of the employees who have participated in this effort. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the next page. Uh, looking at some of our larger sponsorships for the year, we continue our relationship with Rentham Outlet Malls, as well as the TPC Boston PGA event and the Fenway Concert Series. Something new for us this year, we've also worked with Beasley Media Group to successfully implement an outdoor concert series that utilizes our racetrack to hold concerts in the summer been a good success and we're looking forward to more of that next year okay. on the next tab looking at some of our recent marketing highlights uh, it includes a my cash to free slot play conversion my choice my summer and this was our August Mercedes-Benz giveaway 
This was our first major promotion we did under the new My Choice program, where we gave away their choice of a new Mercedes-Benz SLC 300 or $30,000 in cash. Uh, also, we had Responsible Gaming Education Week, where we offered numerous on-property events that included contests and quizzes for our employees that not only educated them, but offered them prizes as well uh, for being well-versed in responsible gaming. Finally, during the week, we partnered with GameSense to, give a, to have a watch giveaway where we first 100 guests for all five days of the event that visited the GameSense booth each received the watch that's pictured here on the right. Mike, Mike can yes. you um, expand a little bit more on the My Cash and the My Choice programs? Sure. What we did is we had a, when we uh, paired with Pinnacle, there was two card programs, two marketing loyalty programs, and we combined them into one, which is the My Cash, uh, or the My Choice card. Mm -hmm. So the My Cash to free slot play conversion essentially allows them to take all of their points that they've earned and give them yet another option as to how they want to spend it and this allows them to take their comp points and turn it into free slot play mm -hmm. so now it's just another option they could go comp at a restaurant they can comp at the gift shop or they can turn it into free slot play mm -hmm. so it, did you find um, you know to the extent you can answer this uh, question that uh, people had points in the two different loyalty programs and decide to combine them? Is that yeah. something that... Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they, they do enjoy the ability to have the one card now at all of our properties across the country. Mm -hmm. It allows you to play here and earn your points. You can go to Colorado, earn your points. You can go up to Maine, earn your points. And it all stays in the one bucket. In conclusion, we wanted to spotlight one of our local community business partners, Camelot Enterprises. Camelot is a veteran business enterprise located in Stoughton, Mass, that opened in 1987. We've been working with them for almost two years as our local provider for many items like you see pictured here. Our team especially loves the work they do with their, with their specialty embroidered items that we often use for employee gifts and incentive giveaways. They do amazing work for us and we continue to look forward to a long future with them. And here, actually, today is a couple of representatives from Camelot that are going to speak. Uh, we have Pam Gladder, our sales rep, and Elliot Kaplan, the owner. And I'd like to introduce them now. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank Good you morning. for coming. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Elliot Kaplan, obviously. Um, Camelot was started by me as a veteran-owned business in uh, 1987. Um, I served the military in, um, during the 60s, both in this in-country and in Germany. Um, I don't have a lot more to say about that. We started the business in 87 with a single screen printing machine. Uh, expanded it by moving to Stoughton in 1993 to a large facility with automatic equipment, both screen printing, embroidery, engraving. Uh, we also offer thousands, literally, of promotional products. Um, we've been working with Eli at uh, at Plain Ridge Park, um, and can, I think can PM you describe can, how? Uh, excuse me. Can you describe the impact of having PPC as a client for your business? It's been excellent. Um, PM can speak more to it. She's worked with Eli and has expanded the whole situation with GameSense and. And then please use like, the microphone. Sure. Thank you. Yes, hi. Um, I met Eli at a South Shore Chamber of Commerce event, and she suggested I apply for the mass gaming. Um, so we sent the application in, and we got approved. And it's been a great relationship. Um, we started off doing some small things like water bottles and marketing promos. And we work with the Human Resource Department to do employee incentives as well. And then we worked with dining, with chef coats, and we work with the loft. And that's expanded um, now to Encore. Um, 
and to other casinos as well as game sense and i really enjoyed the game sense portion and really understand now the importance of uh, of promoting that so that's been a nice relationship and i recently met with someone on the mass gaming who does the marketing as well so it's been a great relationship i just want to say one other thing um, close to the microphone sir yeah. monday is veterans day and i think it would be nice if we can recognize the day here today um, for both veterans and those currently serving well, sir, first we thank you for your thank service. You. And I think that that is a, a, an important point, particularly while we are in this facility, to acknowledge that how much we, as a, a, a commission and agency, appreciate all those who have served, and we will be remembering that service on Monday. My fellow commissioners, did you want to add? Just a quick question about, um, sir, did you realize that as a veteran-owned business, um, there were these kinds of opportunities, or was that new to you? It's new to me. Okay. Yep. Uh, well, we've looked into looked into what we we got the license from Mass Gaming, yes. and since then we've been looking into other avenues as far as veteran-owned situations are concerned. Yep. Okay. Can I ask uh, about that uh, licensing process? I have we have heard anecdotally. Uh, that it could be a bit of a barrier for some uh, businesses to go through the licensing process. What's your perspective? Obviously, you went through it and, and, and now describe the... We had, uh, we had no problems. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought it was straightforward, provided the information as a veteran, provided my separation papers and all of that. I found no problem with, with the process. I thought the process was very smooth, actually. Mm -hmm. Great. Happy right. to hear that. Yeah, I would just add thank you for your service as well. And um, again, I think you're a great example of what the statute envisioned, that even though a lot of the gaming employment opportunities were going to be closer to where a casino was located, I think you're you know, a great example of where spending dollars are having an economic impact beyond the region of where a casino might be located. So congratulations and your good work. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> How do you get your name? Yeah. Well, being, in the, being brought up in the 50s and 60s, uh, JFK obviously was a uh, uh -huh. meaningful representative coming from this area, the whole thing. So we picked that name. Great. Thank yeah. you. Can I Thanks. ask another question, please? Susan. When you did go through the registration process to become a VBE, did you go through the state office or did you go through an, um, a veteran's uh, state office? The state uh, OSD yeah. then. Yeah. That's excellent. I know that they've been working hard to streamline that process. So any, anything that we can uh, do to debunk the idea that it's difficult is, you know, that's an important message for us to send. <coughs> and I suspect that they could use the advocacy of, of veterans like yourself who have had that so if anybody's interested any veteran wants information they're more than free to call me i'll be happy to talk to them about it excellent thank you so much okay. any further questions and that was a, a good question Ed. no i just the golf shirts look very sharp on here <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank, thank, you. You, very thank much. you so much Lance, does this conclude your presentation? Yeah. It does. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> We're good. Thank, uh, thank you. Any questions for? for uh, yes. yes, I had a quick question. <laughs> yes, have yes. A, you, sir. Me. I'm I'm just, you mentioned at the beginning the impact that competition was having. Certainly. Um, is your experience? And you, then you mentioned, but it's only been the first quarter. Yeah. Do you anticipate or do you have experience from other properties where competition um, uh, came came close to, to your resort? Uh, do, you, do you have a strategy? Are you doing a few things differently? Do you expect some of those customers who may have gone off the first quarter and tried, um, tried their hand elsewhere that you may be able to bring some of those folks back? What, what? Sure. So I think uh, parse out two questions there. One is, um, 
do I think that our, some of our customers will return? Certainly. Um, I think at least I can only speak for our openings as a company. We operate 41 properties. Certainly in your first year, um, your goal and, and your job is to drive trial, drive awareness, build the database. And at that point, revenues become more important and they supersede your bottom line number, your EBITDA number. And so at some point, and, and we did the same thing, you begin to pull back on some of your marketing efforts to try to streamline and, and make your operation more efficient. And so yes, I do think at some point, Encore, when MGM, Penn, everybody tries the same thing, and that is the focus out of the gates is to ensure that people are visiting your facility. And then at some point, gradually, you will pull back. And so I do expect, um, at some point, the level of marketing that is occurring now for Encore probably is dialed back a bit. Um, and as far as people rejoining us or coming back to the property, yeah, normally you see a spike if you're the opening property, if you're the existing property, you see a decline. Um, but as time goes on, um, we will see some of our customers return. Um, I would point out, however, what is likely to occur is that maybe they're not just our customers going forward, however, it's likely that we'll see a split. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll visit Encore, sometimes they'll visit us, um, sort of depends on the day of the week. And so while it's not necessarily a loss of customers, it becomes more a loss of trips. Thank you. Yep. So you focused on primarily on uh, the competition being within the Commonwealth as opposed to from uh, neighboring states. That's your your um, your data is revealing that. As far as who our primary competition is. Yes. Right now, in terms of that loss, you focused on within the Commonwealth versus in, from other jurisdictions. Tough to tell. So, so I would argue that our biggest competition is Rhode Island, given the proximity and geography, about 25 minutes to, to Twin River from our facility. The, the challenge there is to try to quantify it. They were already opening, or they were already open when we opened, mm -hmm. so we didn't see a loss of revenue, per se, when they opened. But I would argue that our primary competitor is Twin River. Um, however, we wouldn't have seen a loss in revenue because they were already there, they were an existing facility, so we're only experiencing that with Encore. But if the question is who is our competition, it's, it's the closest competitor. Well, and I think our early research revealed that, uh, that PPC repatriated $100 million from other jurisdictions, which of course was a goal right. of the um, Expanded Gaming Act, so I wondered if you have, you know, if you had felt that in any way the other jurisdictions were were taking any of those repatriated dollars back. It, it's interesting for us. Um, what we have seen is that, uh, as we just mentioned, Encore has been very aggressive out of the gates. Mm -hmm. um, and Twin River has reacted a little bit. I think a second question mm -hmm. you had was, are we going to do things different? We're not. We're not going to get into an arms race or a spending war. That's. That's not who we are based on our size. We're a $260 million facility compared to a $2.6 billion facility. Very different facility, very different operation, very different marketing spend. Um, and so our approach is to let that work itself out. It will come back in line. We're not going to change dramatically the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And so along those lines, um, you know, a lot of what um, could happen uh, in terms of this uh, this competition, which was predicted, um, perhaps falls into two categories: competing for an existing customer, and then growing the market. So, um, how would you can you comment relative to the to the growing the market piece, which would be something that we, for one, would be interested in, you know, learning? Yeah. So these are, these are all public numbers, and so we're. We're, we're studying feverishly in, in preparation for our budget meeting in a couple of weeks. And so one of the things that we have found, public numbers, if you include Connecticut, Rhode Island, and all of Massachusetts, even with the addition of Encore, I believe the market growth was 3.8%, which, which speaks to me at least that it's a redistribution of the existing pie, um, more so than it is growing the market. Now those are slot numbers only because table games numbers are not released for the state of Connecticut, so I can only speak to those slot revenues. But I, I guess I'm a little surprised at, uh, at how small that number is. I think um, it's certainly easier for everybody when the market is growing. This appears at 3.8% to be more a redistribution. 
Lance, a quick question relative to um, the lottery. And I know some of the numbers uh, year over year are down. I'm assuming some of that is just based on a corresponding dip in visitation. Uh, but have you needed to have or thought about having any conversations with our colleagues at the lottery in terms of new product mix or more machines or whatever a solution might be to drive some of those numbers up? Happy to do so. Um, I think our revenues, you know, public uh, public numbers, are down about 18 to 19 percent. A lot of revenues were only down about 8.65 percent. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, outperforming, if you will. But um, certainly happy to to reconnect with the lottery. It has been a while. Yeah. Lance, one question on that, I, and I think I saw the slide, and it and it addressed the. Um, ticket sales in the, in the player activated terminals. Do you have Kino as well? We do. And did I miss that in terms of the, the numbers? Is, is that all included? It though? is included, okay, yes. Yes, we have Kino, uh, certainly at Flutie's we offer Kino. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ed. Moving on to item number five on our agenda, Dr. Lightbound, please, on our racing, um, our director of our racing division. Good morning, Chad. Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, our first item on the uh, racing agenda is the uh, racing update. And i uh, just going to do a quick one. I know we have a lot of different items on the agenda today. Um, earlier this summer at Plain Ridge, they held the Spirit of Mass uh, Trot for $250,000. And they added a new race this year, the Clara Barton Pace. Um, this was another uh, great way to showcase Plain Ridge and get some national attention. Uh, and it had the benefit um, there were some uh, people that had Massachusetts ties that actually um, their horse finished second in the race um, in the um, Massachusetts uh, spirit of mass race um, and then in the um, Claire Barton um, some Massachusetts natives uh, won with their horse mm -hmm. so um, that was uh, kind of a highlight to not only have a big race like that but also have New England connections and Massachusetts connections do well through the day. Um, on the screen is a picture of um, Commissioner Cameron um, in the oh. with the winner's trophy. Um, Dr. Lightbaum, I think there are many, many people in that <laughs> <laughs> You included Dr. Yeah. Lightbaum. I'll, I'll name a few of them. They, they had a um, nice day of um, different um, people come out for it. Um, one of the people in there is the Massachusetts House of Representative um, Elizabeth um, Peoria, and I uh, apologize if I pronounced her last name wrong. Um, sportscaster Bob Newmeyer was there. Hall of Fame harness trainer, uh, driver John Campbell was there. Um, and then um, some local uh, Plain Ridge people, Nancy Longabody, Melissa Rico were in the picture. Um, and then their uh, board of selectmen from Plain Ridge were there and the Patriots Minutemen. So mm -hmm. it's quite a day. Um, <laughs> and do you know the overall attendance? They don't keep attendance figures there because there is no um, charge of admission. So right. I, there isn't I think a figure. I, we heard that it was certainly up over the. Yes, they had a nice turnout. It was on a um, weekend day, so that they could do that. It was a lot, a lot of people. There. Yeah, bring, right. bringing good business to Plainville. Absolutely, and Plainville. people were excited about the local ties winning races. Yes, they really were. Alex, a, a quick question, um, and maybe you know this. How, how did Clara Barton get a? race named after <laughs> <laughs> don't equate her with racing it's the red cross they, they think they were trying to um, come up with names for you know related to massachusetts okay and that's how they came up with that Sounds one good. um steve o'toole apologizes for not being able to be here today he had a prior um engagement but um the next time he's at a meeting <laughs> he may uh, be able to elaborate on his decision to name it that all right uh, the other um, exciting thing at Plain Ridge, which we just finished up, was the Sire Stakes for the Massachusetts Bread Santa Breads. That program has um, expanded greatly. Um, 
the, they had three legs, three different weekends where they held uh, trials to qualify for the finals. Um, the finals themselves, they gave out $800,000 in purses that day, and the overall was $1.8 million for that series. So it was uh, definitely worth it. I looked back to 2013, which was before any of the um, gaming money came in, um, before Penn came. Um, and that year, the total sire stakes purses was 253000 So that's a, obviously a huge increase. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another exciting thing was for the uh, two-year-old pacing, Colts and Geldings division actually had to be split into two different races because they had enough horses for that. Mm -hmm. So that program is expanding. Uh, Suffolk Downs um, completed their uh, final racing this summer. And um, I was going to go through and bring up statistics and all that, but you know those numbers end up in our annual report mm -hmm. and all, and people can see those. Um, the final day, um, they did have uh, 12,000, over 12,000 people come. Um, for attendance. Um, the handle's always been good. Uh, they had um, a t-shirt um, that you could buy and the proceeds went to Thoroughbred Aftercare. Um, and I just, rather than go through different numbers and all, um, I wanted to read a quote from Susan Walsh, our chief steward, um, who's been at Suffolk since she was a uh, hot walker there, which is basically starting at the very bottom level. And then she worked her way up as a groom, um, became an owner, uh, trainer, eventually um, she uh, became our chief steward. So she's, uh, her, to quote Susan Walsh, horse racing is in the end so much more <clears throat> than a list of winners or statistics on attendance. It's a crazy quilt of memories that can never be erased from those who have spent the best part of their lives here. Mm. I thought that was an appropriate uh, send off for stuff. <clears throat> And Alex, I know it's meaningful to you too. It, <laughs> it is, thank you. Do you, you want to share a favorite story? Uh, let's see. I actually had a baby shower in the. <laughs> it was given to me in the um, what's called the trainers um, viewing room. It's right on the uh, turn of the track, um, so the trainers can stand there and watch their horses work in the morning. And they did it as a surprise. The way they got me there was they um, had the chief steward at the time tell me that there was somebody coming from out of town to do an inspection on the test barn. Oh. And so I needed to be down there. <laughs> wow. And I drove our people crazy beforehand saying, you know, make sure everything's in for They were all in on the joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah, that, and um, that's a personal one. The other things are obviously the horses and the people there. It was incredible, um, very much like a family. Yes. And um, generations of people uh, through their families would work there. And, yeah, very exciting times. And you saw famous horses. Yes, yep. Mm -hmm. They had um, several horses of the year that attended the Mascap, a Kentucky Derby winner that was in it. Um, Cigar was treated as um, a celebrity. Um, he was vanned from New York and had a state police escort the whole way, the horse. Yep. Uh, so those were definitely some exciting days. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's see, our next um, item is the um, 2020 racing application and I'll ask um, the Plain Ridge folks to come up. Good morning. So um, today I have Lenny Calderon, um, the announcer and um, racing services manager, and Jason Savistano, the mutual manager here in, in um, place of Steve O'Toole to answer questions you may have. Um, you all have had a chance to have the public hearing um, for comments. You've seen the application. Um, They've um, basically asked uh, for harness racing dates April 6th through uh, November 27th. It's a very similar uh, calendar to this year um, with the one change is that they've added a couple of days. This year they'll do 108, next year they'll do 110 um, through an agreement with the Harness Horsemen's Association. And they're gonna add the, as two Sundays that they're gonna add. Um, I won't read the requirements. Um, those are in the memo and, and come straight from the um, statute. Um, the um, number of days that they're going to race will also um, make them um, in compliance 
for the ability to simulcast that that lens legislation still in there for at least 100 days and which they will have with 110 um, the one thing that we have done um, for the last uh, four years is ask that they have an independent uh, review of the track surface done um, the first year in 2016 ed ryan did it he's been associated with freehold yonkers and is consulted on different training centers building tracks and things like that um, the last three years, Dan Herbst from uh, Rosecroft um, has done it with the Maryland uh, Jockey Club. So um, this year, we're just asking that they um, have somebody new come in to um, do their review. And again, this is a kind of a, basically a standard operating procedure that we've done now for four years. This will be the fifth year. Uh, does the commission have any questions on the application? Do you have any, um, are you going to, approve or comment on who they select in terms of the qualifications of who's looking at it uh, or just please don't use somebody you've used in the past uh, they usually bring a name to me with okay. their qualifications so, so that'll happen before they yeah it'll be informal them. yes right yeah so um dr lightbaum uh obviously from the hearing this application has uh, very strong community uh, support which is yes. a, always a positive thing when we look at licenses every year. Uh, so that I look at as a positive thing. I, again, I mentioned at the hearing, and I'll mention it again, we really do appreciate um, uh, the association working with uh, Penn National in order to uh, jointly come together with racing days, um, which is great. I know there's a long-term contract in place, so we really do appreciate and think that's best when, when there is that collaboration to do things the right way. And I, um, I know the track has been uh, the safety, and we take that very seriously. In fact, I don't think there are too many standard bred tracks around the country um, that really require the safety check. I think it's a really important piece. Um, and to have someone different, I think, is, is it makes sense, too, because we want people to feel, uh, we, want, we want it to be safe. Yes. And, um, I know you feel strongly about that. You've always uh, had the best interest of, of the participants, whether they be drivers or uh, horses, mm -hmm. um, their safety. So I commend you for always having that um, first uh, before anything else, that, that safety issue. So um, I think those, those are very good, strong uh, pieces in, in support of this application. Yeah, it is a strong application. Mm -hmm. okay. Commissioner yeah, um, just to put a finer point to that, uh, to, to the prior comments, um, the, the Harness Horsemen Association um, uh, highlights uh, in their comments um, the need for some replenishment of the track. Um, does anybody, Jason or Lenny, want to talk a little bit about that? Um, or are we... Um, to take the inspection to be the one to really tell us whether uh, there is indeed some need for replenishment of the surface. I'm sorry, you said about the replenishment. Yes, in the in the back there's a, there's a letter from the horseman's group saying that the track cover material needs uh, replenishment. Uh, okay. Is that um, uh, something you agree with or disagree with or is going to be left for the inspection? I guess before you answer, have yes. you had an opportunity to actually take a look at yeah. what I, I have not, but I would, I would okay. defer, if you're not prepared to answer, defer that's to Steve okay. O'Toole on that and he's looking into it. Okay. So, yeah. Well, let me put the question to uh, Alex. Um, what, what do you see happening um, relative to this, to this topic? We'll wait for the inspection. Well, um, Steve O'Toole has offered to meet with the Harness Horsemen, and that's yep. um, where we've left it, is that they should get together. Um, track maintenance is an ongoing issue. That's something that happens every day. Microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, track maintenance is something that happens every day. They have their machines out on the track and all that. And um, comments from uh, drivers on a daily basis can be made um, to management if they notice something um, either sometimes the track is too deep sometimes it's too hard um, those types of things can be uh, taken care of immediately and um, I don't know um, if they I'm not sure on the stone dust level right now um, I was up there uh, on the um, uh, 
Steyer Stakes Day watching, and we could see that with Steve O'Toole, we could see the machines going around, and you could see that it was, you know, digging down into, there was um, stone dust there, and it was, you know, it looked like it was deep enough. I'm not an expert on tracks. Mm -hmm. But um, again, we have told the harness horsemen that they need to sit, sit and meet with Steve O'Toole on those concerns. Mm -hmm. And that's something that doesn't um, need to come to the commission. They can say, we noticed that there's a, uh, needs to be some stone dust in this area, and Steve can take care of that immediately. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, you are an expert, though, on the safety of horses um, and what it takes to maintain that. And um, have you seen evidence um, of, of um, breakdowns with horses, which would be an indication that maybe there's an issue with the track? Yeah, we haven't seen them. Uh, that we we did have one that um, had a fracture that needed to be euthanized. Um, on the standard bred side, that we don't see the um, number of incidences that they do on the thoroughbred side, mm -hmm. and um, it's not uh, unusual. Looking back at our statistics, some years we go without any incidences there. Um, other times there may be one or two. And um, we haven't finished doing a complete review on that particular incident yet. Um, it may or may not have been due um, to the track surface. So every time there is an issue uh, with a horse, you do look into the matter and see if you can identify uh, if there is a safety concern? Yes, any time there's a uh, horse that dies at the track, regardless of what the reason is, we have an autopsy done mm -hmm. on it, a full autopsy by an accredited lab, you know, laboratory that does this and they give us that information back. We also uh, get a blood sample from that horse and send it to our lab for drug testing mm -hmm. and um, those have always come back negative. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. What time of year did that happen? Do you know approximately when that happened? To it, horse? it happened maybe about a month ago. About a month ago. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and at our public hearing the issue around safety was discussed as well uh, uh, when Mr. O'Toole was here to address uh, the application. Yes. So thank you for uh, filling in the details today. Any further questions about the application? I think uh, what <clears throat> when you look at the requirements, the public hearing was very helpful because we did hear from so many of the stakeholders, including the community members who and including uh, our public safety uh, uh, officials, the chief of police and the chief uh, of the fire department were uh, able to address issues around uh, the racing and they really acknowledged that there have been uh, really minimal issues around community public safety. And in terms of the horse racing, I think what I see here is a request for a vote conditioned on again what has been the practice in any case of um, you know, yes. certifying as to the the quality of the track this year you just want to make sure to be completely transparent with all stakeholders that it would be a new uh, an, an, a new entity that would do the review yes and that, that doesn't um, in no way um, puts a negative no. um, comment on the people who have done it in the past that's they right. were all well qualified Excellent. Any further questions? Uh, so do you want to, uh, for the record, state your recommendation, Dr. Lightbow? Okay. Uh, my recommendation is that Plain Ridge will have an independent, uh, well, <clears throat> that I might, let me start over again. The Racing Division recommends that the Commission approve the application of Plain Ridge uh, Gaming and Development LLC, Plain Ridge Race Course for Live Harness Racing in 2020 with the following condition. Plain Ridge will have an independent expert that hasn't previously reviewed the track surface, review the track surface prior to racing. The Massachusetts Gaming Commission reserves the right to ask for further reviews during the racing season. So, Madam Chair, uh, I would move that the Commission approve the application of Harness Horse Racing License filed by Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC, also known as Plain Ridge Park Racecourse, for the calendar year 2020 subject to the conditions outlined in the memo uh, from Dr. Lightbaum included in the Commission's packet and um, any other conditions discussed at the meeting today, which I believe there were no other conditions that we discussed. So the ones that uh, 
uh, Dr. Lightbaum has included in the packet. Second. Any further discussion? Any con additional condition? Okay. The, uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0, please, Captain. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the racing season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lenny. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, well. Thank you so much. If I may say one thing, oh, um, yeah. I know. Uh, Mr. Sevens, you asked about the Clara Barton, how we, how we chose that name. Yep. If I could give a little bit of insight into that. Oh. My understanding is that uh, Paul Verrett, our race secretary, was looking for, um, he was going through the historical records, uh, somebody w that was a native of Massachusetts, and he came, uh, and he, I guess he looked through the, 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 the books there, and he came up with Clara Barton because she was a volunteer nurse. She was a native uh, of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a volunteer for the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. So that's how the name came to okay. be. Mm -hmm. So. Any thoughts on a, you know, a Jeff Kinney memorial or ceremonial race? Or I'm sorry, for what? A Jeff Kinney race. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Lightbell, moving on to item 5C. Uh, our uh, next item is the racing uh, annual report for the year 2018. Um, you have it in front of you and it's in the packet so we're not going to um, read it word for word um, just go over some highlights um, Suffolk Downs raced um, eight days um, and in that year um, Plain Ridge Park raced 110 days um, the um, number of um, drug positives that we had went down a little bit in 2018. We always strive to do as much um, education as possible. We have a trainer's manual that um, is posted on the website. We leave a copy um, in our, the, there's an office uh, hallway that we share with the racing office that the horsemen have access to. Um, we leave a copy there um, and try to get the word out. Uh, we have a whole list of medications on the controlled therapeutic schedule that have thresholds and um, how to avoid getting over the threshold level. So um, we did see the levels go down a little bit at Plain Ridge, which was great. Um, at uh, Suffolk, um, it did go up a little bit. Um, that might have just been that with Suffolk Downs, uh, the type of racing there, you're getting so many people coming um, all at once from out of state that may have been in jurisdictions that um, may have had slightly different regulations. Um, I think if there's, um, the rulings stayed fairly uh, similar levels uh, between that and 2017 between the uh, judges at Plain Ridge and then the stewards at Suffolk Downs. At Suffolk Downs there was a um, claiming issue that the um, stewards very diligently worked on and um, did a lot of research on as well as with um, folks from Suffolk Downs um, and uh, uh, discovered this um, false claim that involved maybe 10 different people. So all of those people got uh, rulings against them and that's one of the reasons why the uh, rulings at Suffolk Downs that year were increased. It's not necessarily that um, all of a sudden there were a lot of issues. It was that one particular incident happened to involve a lot of people. Um, I'll turn it over to Chad now if he wants to go over maybe some of the financial highlights. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, after going through all the financials in the report, uh, I did a bit of attribution um, analysis, and overall we saw um, a an increase in the revenue categories um, across all line items um, except for uh, the association licensing fee, which was down roughly 3%. Um, and as Alex had noted, the, the, on the compliance side, the fines and penalties on a monetary value were down slightly. Um, but everything else um, what was up. Uh, so overall, that was good on the, the revenue side. Um, I think you know, one of the biggest um, attribution uh, for that was there was a 7% uptick in simulcast. Um, Suffolk Downs alone was up $10 million in that. So that's um, 
that's been happening over the past three or four years. The simulcast has really been increasing year over year. Um, and then also there was um, uh, an increase of 13% in, in licensing fees. Um, so overall, um, it was uh, a, a lot of positive items on that. And um, I just wanted to put out if there's any questions out there that you had. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lightbaum, you mentioned um, when you talked about medication uh, overages and yes. what the statistics were that you actually spent some time um, with uh, educating people, right? How to avoid an overage. Yes. So that's, that was of interest to me. So you're actually trying to be proactive here in assisting uh, individuals on how to be smart about, um, you know, uh, substances that are allowed, but certainly at only a percentage, right? Only a level. Right. They, they realized um, that there's a subset of drugs that are used by even maybe your pet veterinarian uses every day. They're legitimate drugs to use with animals to help them heal or um, get over a, a cold and infection, different things. Um, and so obviously we want to be able to treat the racehorses uh, with those therapeutic medications. Uh, a lot of those also would not be appropriate to find in a horse that's actively racing. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a, a pain reliever, you know, it's certainly appropriate if the horse just got injured, but you don't want it in the horse that's actually racing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's probably been seven or eight years ago, they came up, RCI mm -hmm. came up with a list of therapeutic medications, and they've added a few over the years. I think it was around 20 to begin with, and now it's up to around 30. Mm -hmm. Um, of drugs that you can legitimately use, and it just gives guidelines on when to stop using them, um, how much you can give, you know, to stay under the threshold limits. Um, it's not uh, necessarily an exact science because there's different things that can affect how a horse metabolizes drugs, um, but it is a help to um, trainers and veterinarians. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think it's important that you saw fit to emphasize and try to assist with uh, with with knowledge, right? How to do this better, yes. rather than say, we got you on the back end. You're trying to be pro proactive on the front end so that people don't run into a problem with medication. Yes, we we prefer not to have any positives. Yes. Um, that would be uh, that's easier for everybody. Yeah. Um, and we want it's uh, we want fair racing, so right. Right. Uh, we want it fair for everybody and and everybody to be following the same guidelines. Thank you. So it's, it's a great report, of course, because of timing, um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, um, calendar year end of 2018. Right. Um, we can probably expect something really similar um, in terms of numbers for 2019 because racing and simulcasting was probably uh, among the same levels. Um, but it is for 2020 that we might see um, a, a, a change um, of course, we'll have to see what, what that is, depending on what happens with, uh, with the legislation, given that now we don't have a uh, application from Suffolk Downs, um, and we won't, even, there's, there's still a question um, as to whether and how long they'll be able to simulcast um, in the next uh, mm -hmm. calendar year. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so I just wanted to point that uh, for the record. Yes. I have, I have one quick question. Marianne, can you go to slide 34, please? It's, the last, it's a photo on the last page. So uh, I just oh, no. noticed uh, Commissioner Stebbins is holding a bucket. Yes. I didn't know if you were doing double duty that day. I'm not a licensed test barn official. But I think it was more of a prop. The bucket was empty. <laughs> For the record, that's a water bucket. It's not a uh, bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I go back to the fact I was unlicensed. I didn't know the difference. <laughs> Did you know the difference exactly? <laughs> Thankfully, no. I'm a great team down there at the test. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I thought the uh, report was particularly helpful for me as I continue to learn more about the, uh, the horse racing industry, particularly the racing terminology. Um, thank you very much on that. I, I have a question that I, I um, forgive me for not knowing the answer. 
With respect to simulcasting, those revenues are treated in this, how are they treated for the purpose of, of um, state benefits in terms of local aid and, and taxes? We, there's no tax rate on simulcasting, correct? So the... I'm if you could walk me just through how they're treated, that would be great. So the, the simulcasting is, for local aid purposes, is lumped in under the handle. Under um, the handle. It's yeah, the total all handle. There's no different treatment. So the $10 million that was extra that came through Suffolk would be uh, subject to the same division as uh, all the rest of the handle. Correct. Okay. Confirming what I understood. Thank you so much. Excellent report. Thank you. And thanks for um, nice job. You know, nice job. Uh, such a successful season and um, very ethical and uh, you know, the proactive piece of what you do. It's much appreciated. Thank you. So item D is a uh, raising legislation update and um, Catherine Blue, our chief legal counsel, um, is, uh, did the memo for it. Um, We've both um, been following the different bills and are mm -hmm. waiting to see what happens with that for raising. So in the commission packet today, there is a memo regarding the legislation that is before um, the legislature. The commission's, the, the, the racing statutes, uh, chapter 128A and 128C were scheduled to sunset last July. At that point, the legislature passed an extension until January 15th of 2020. So at the moment, the legislature has a choice. They need to act before January 15th, 2020, or racing in the Commonwealth will no longer be allowed. They can either pass another extension, which would look very much like attachment A to this memo, or they can pass another racing bill. And what you have in the packet are three bills that address racing. The first one is HB 13. That is the commission bill. It is broad, and it gives the commission a great deal of flexibility to address the issues that um, impact racing through the regulatory process. SB 101 is a similar kind of bill. It has some slightly different terms, and it is a little more specific in terms of what's statutory versus what's regulatory. And there are some, some points in SB 101 that would be worth considering by the commission if they were to create regulations around racing. Um, HB 322 is another bill. It's, it's set up in a way that uh, it doesn't seem to either extend 128A or 128C. And it, I think it would have some difficulty standing alone. But it also tracks very much what SB 101 does and HB 13. And then finally, just because it's been out in public, there is HB 4070. It's a gaming bill. The reason it's in this memo is because the proponent for that bill has talked about a racing component to any gaming application they would file. So there's been a lot of attention paid to that bill as well. Um, Alex and I can answer any questions. We've been watching these as they've gone through. Again, the date to take some sort of action is coming up. I, first of all, um, General Counsel, I appreciated this memo. I thought it was very well put together, mm -hmm. gave an excellent snapshot of each of the pieces of legislation that we've been hearing about and that are out there. Um, you know, once again, we're faced with another pending deadline of where, uh, you know, the, the can kind of keeps getting kicked down the road a little bit. Um, you know, I think this is, um, it, it seems unusual and not commonplace in the Commonwealth for regs of an existing business to keep getting sunsetted. Uh, I think it creates some level of uh, uncertainty for operators, certainly some uncertainty for potential operators. Um, and at a time when we, when we know one segment of this industry is doing really well, which is uh, with respect to harness racing by evidence of an extended purse agreement, uh, I think I saw in the packet that we have an increasing membership in the Harness Horsemen's Association. All good signs that are pointing to success in that industry. And, you know, it, it, it seems to me that 
you know, the regs are not keeping up with you know the state of the industry as it is right now in Massachusetts. So, you know, one suggestion I would, uh, uh, you know, we can certainly consider is I would like it like to see this commission renew emphasis for the bill that we've had uh, up on Beacon Hill for a number of years, and whether that you know wouldn't be at this meeting, but our next meeting maybe re, you know give the commission a chance to re-vote our support for the bill or whether we would you know allow our chair to put a new cover letter together with our existing bill and and send it off to legislative leadership I think that would be helpful but uh, you know again we're looking at some just uh, you know in January deadline um, that you know we usually wait up until the 23rd hour to figure out whether you know Plain Ridge or uh, you know the folks at Suffolk could even do you know uh, accept bets or simulcast or anything and it uh, uh, again you know I think we're at a, the right time and the right moment to give some more emphasis to our bill which you know kind of creates an open and transparent process going forward as to how we'd work with the horse racing industry. <coughs> I think uh, Commissioner Stebbins, you're referring to the January 15th deadline yes. for 2020. You, you know, I, I agree with uh, uh, um, everything that you uh, say in, um, in um, conceptually. Um, I would I would add a couple of things. Um, you, you know, just a very fine point. Uh, you, you referred to um, uh, regs that keep getting extended, and it's really the legislation. Uh, it's a statute that. Uh, uh, um, uh, I just wouldn't want to confuse it with the uh, authority that we do have when it, when it comes to promulgating regs and the one that we don't have, which is the legislative action. Um, I do uh, think that uh, uh, and agree that the memo lays out really the key the key summary or the key aspects of and the differences uh, of the bills. But I think it really, and perhaps this is what you were alluding to, uh, uh, Commissioner, it really um, might be helpful to revisit um, the reasons of some of the recommendations when it came to what we what we drafted, um, the um, the history and uh, evolution um, of, of of racing in, in in this state, but in many other states as well, uh, is one that um, has resulted in a lot of different numbers and premiums and takeouts, um, and 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 for one, uh, what we feel that our, uh, the, 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 the legislation that we were requiring and, and met the requirement to submit to the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that they, uh, that, that it would accomplish, uh, uh, we thought at the time, and I think it's still valid now, is streamline significantly the ability to regulate uh, racing. Um, not just give uh, the industry and the stakeholders certainty, which is critical, uh, but then whatever cannot be um, determined have the commission, this body, to have uh, the flexibility and uh, to be um, uh, deliberative, analytical and whatnot and come to ultimately uh, a resolution either via regulation or, 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 or anything else or votes. So um, I I have to imagine that uh, just given very recent history at the legislature, they, uh, you know, because they, they extend at the 11th hour, um, they may not really appreciate, uh, uh, you know, the, the thought that went into what we put together. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, to the extent that we can, we should, we should remind that um, uh, or make it or send a, a memo like this with additional um, some of the additional, some of the research that I know we did at the time when we compared, um, you know, the takeouts and premiums in other states and what other states, for example, have done uh, to try to streamline and, and update uh, their, own, their own legislation. So I think that's, that's some of the things that we could, uh, we could highlight. I'm, uh, I'm not optimistic that there's a lot of time to do that between now and January uh, 15. Um, it's something that we've talked about at some, at some point. Uh, but I think again, this um, this memo begin to really begins to really articulate the key differences, uh, uh, and one of 
simply to me is that with our uh, legislation, we think we have we would have the ability to, uh, among other things, um, help the industry as it was intended in the Gaming Act. The Racehorse Development Fund uh, that was put together with with its moving pieces, the split and whatnot, um, is uh, and was always meant to be uh, an important um, piece to to aid the industry uh, and. Um, our ability to do that, especially in the thoroughbred side, has been constrained by the recent short-term extensions. Um, so, I just want to clarify the process. First off, I think I've, I've given my thanks to you, uh, uh, Catherine, on the memo. It was very, very helpful, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> there was a filing deadline, in my right, uh, uh, Councilor Blue for for, for, for refiling this particular uh, SB 13. Yes, and we met that deadline last fall. It was last fall, not in this current. Did no, because we, file we something are something again be, this. Because we are a state agency, we filed the November prior to the beginning, and, and that's when we refiled. And that was filed under your name, uh, Executive Director Bedrosian. Is that how it worked? I it think. was filed under the commission's name. So as the a, as a it came commission from the bill. commission. So there was some discussion in last fall as mm -hmm. to the support. So what I'm hearing from my fellow commissioners is that <clears throat> while it was filed properly through the channels, it might be helpful to, in an informal, less formal uh, communication, reiterate uh, the commission's position on on uh, this particular filing. I don't think today we're prepared, I wouldn't be prepared to necessarily say we endorse the, this particular exact submission without further clarification. With that said, I, I do think we could have time to get together some, you know, a, a letter, mm -hmm. correspondence on the filing. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, there is a process um, that the legislature expects, and I'm not sure if we could this is a question if we could actually amend it at this time or not so but we could certainly communicate whether we would suggest in the sausage making an amendment should be made of sorts so perhaps we can think about it for a future mm -hmm. meeting with some work done by um, executive Bedrosian and, and and Catherine and her team no, I, I would make the same comment. The draft that's been resubmitted is something that happened, the meat of it happened before I arrived and before you arrived. And so there's been some discussion, but there hasn't been a deep dive. I, I trust and assume with the expertise in the office that any markedly necessary changes would have been made. Um, but I do think having had this experience in other offices, there, it's always good to take a fresh set of eyes and look at it again. Um, I, I do think this is a good opportunity, however, to... Um, maybe remind the legislature of our submission uh, and the mm. fact that I agree with you. I remember conversations you and I specifically had disagreeing over an approach having to do with certain monies connected um, to racing and the, dis the frustration in the, the only the sun setting rather than sort of taking a good look at it. Given the closing of Suffolk, also I think this is a very different landscape. And so I think that's an even more pressing reason to sort of go back to the legislature, remind them of the submission, um, because I, I do think it is something that needs to be addressed. Yep, I would agree. I, I think um, it never hurts to, uh, in an appropriate way, um, push something forth again that we think makes sense. You know, further communication is always helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure that we all know on the record a process was followed appropriately. Mm -hmm. That there's only a certain window to f file, so thank you mm -hmm. for that. And uh, we can put it on our if agenda. We, we, if you want, commissioners, we can think about um, drafting a some type of communication that talks about the history of the bill, where the commission is now, and recognizes the potential for modifications and, as you appropriately call it, the sausage making process. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think the other thing we want to just remind <laughs> folks, I think. 
everyone here knows it and people in the industry know it, but the connection between the racing bill and simulcasting, right? It's not just about racing, right. it is about simulcasting. When you hear those figures, that's important. So just to remind folks that there are different components of this. Right, and, and again, the commission really hasn't as a whole right. voted on this, uh, in but I, in terms of even if we know we have a consensus, so it would be a draft that could help guide our discussion. Sure. I think that would be excellent. Sure. I think there's also the component that, uh, because we always think about the impact of, <coughs> of um, what the commission regulates on a, looking through a, a wide lens, there are issues around jobs <coughs> attached to both the racing and simulcasting, and the revenue numbers are important too. So yeah. we should think, with the the, the the wider lens as well as the the statutory um, submission. Any further discussion on that? Excellent, excellent job on the um, the memo. Thank you. Any, uh, Catherine? Did you <coughs> want to add now that we've chatted? Anything that further insights based on what we just talked about? No. Okay, you're all set. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So does that conclude the, the racing legislative update? Any, any further questions on that? Then we go into the split discussion 5E for purposes of our agenda. And, any and if you could remind us of the makeup of that that committee, I know it's chaired by a gubernatorial appointee, and, and Gail is our representative. Yeah. The uh, horse racing committee consists of five members. The chair is Brian Fitzgerald. He's appointed by the governor. There is an appointee from the treasurer, Emily. Con I can't pronounce her last name, and I'm sorry, Kotunski. There is a representative from the Standard Bread, which is Peter Goldberg, a representative from the Thoroughbred, which is um, Joe Savage, and then Commissioner Cameron is our representative from the commission. Thank you. So, um, as you can see, as outlined in the memo, um, the a uh, newly constituted um, committee uh, did meet this fall, uh, met a couple of times, had submissions from both, um, both breeds regarding what they thought was appropriate for a split. The, uh, the committee many years ago, the original committee decided it would be appropriate to meet um, every year because racing was changing. Um, pretty considerable changes, especially on both, w with both breeds, right? Um, Penn National, um, uh, with, with the Racehorse uh, Development Fund and um, increased monies, uh, increased interest, increased race days. And um, this, the thoroughbreds, obviously, the opposite is, is true. Very few opportunities to race. So I think um, the committee takes all of that into consideration. Uh, race days is one of many, many factors. Um, really um, thoughtful review of all of the submissions as well. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum and her team um, is very good at providing um, the, the committee with real numbers, hard numbers, um, um, not only on participants, licensees, um, monies generated, uh, but all of the ancillary uh, pieces that, that everyone doesn't typically think about, meaning farms, how many horses, <coughs> how many new horses for both breeds each year, um, all of the employees, which is a critical piece, and um, so all, all, all of those factors are taken into consideration. And it's, it's, it's a difficult um, job for the committee because both breeds are very, very passionate about racing and having their, um, um, uh, you know, thoroughbred racing be successful, harness bred, uh, you know, just uh, harness racing be successful. So there's spirited discussions, 
I believe the committee, um, I was one of the four that voted in favor of this uh, split. Um, it, it really turned out 5% more went to the standard bread this year because of um, all the additional, um, uh, the generation, the, 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 the folks involved, the, the, the race days, the, all, all of the um, relevant factors that were really, the committee was very thoughtful about taking a look at. So um, the recommendation is for 5% more to, to go to the standard bread side. Um, and, um, and what we did not do this year as a committee was um, get involved in any of the retroactive pieces, and I think that was a good decision as well. There were many unintended consequences around that that we worked hard to, um, to avoid. Um, so as a member of that committee, I think this is a sound recommendation and um, one that the, our commission should approve. Any questions for uh, Commissioner Cameron or for Dr. Lightbound on this on the split? I, I would just add I was very happy to see the the retroactive piece not included this year. I think yeah. that was right. a fair way fair way to treat both uh, both horsemen's groups. Mm -hmm. And the types of factors, as I understand, that the committee considers is not only the number of race days, but just around open space, the breeders, yes. impact on breeders, the mm -hmm. ancillary services. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, so it goes beyond the number of race days. It, so it does. It really and that's does. where the 5% increase. Yes, because of the additional, um, uh, you know, the additional, um, the, the, entire, the entire focus of racing, the entire, um, when you look at all of the the other factors that you just mentioned, um, the committee really did believe an additional 5% to standard bread was, uh, was appropriate. Um, the, of course, the one vote here would be the, the representative from the thorough, thoroughbred industry. And of course, they're, they're very hopeful that there could be another track here in the Commonwealth and there would be some monies there to, to uh, assist with, with that endeavor. So that's obviously a very, um, uh, uh, I, we understood completely uh, their point of view and and um, came to this decision realizing all of those factors and considering them all. And like this committee, it's a public um, public uh, meeting. Oh, it is, and mm -hmm. there, there's always an interested um, group of individuals, passionate folks when it comes to racing all with both breeds and many of them were represented at our at our meetings this year. Any qu further questions? Do I have a motion? Yeah, I would move that uh, the commission approve the split of the racehorse development fund recommended by the horse racing committee. As uh, fully described in the memorandum from uh, General Counsel Blue and uh, Dr. Lightbaum, Director of Racing, in the November 7, 2019 uh, Commission's packet. Second. Further questions? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Now, back to Chad. Um, this is item 5F, the quarterly local aid report. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Each quarter, in accordance with Section 18D of Chapter 58, local aid is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts are calculated at 0.35 times the handle for the quarter ending six months prior to payment. The local aid payment for the quarter ending in September 30th, 2019 is in the amount of $168,536.99. This amount reflects the total handle from racing that took place in January, February, and March of 2019. And on the second page, you will see a breakdown of the handle 
as well as the distributions that are payable to each city and town. And this item does require a vote. Thank you. Questions for Chad? Looks pretty straightforward. Um, all of the numbers are in order and um, um, I'm sure have, have been um, checked and rechecked and they're accurate. That's, the, that's what we come to expect from, from this team, so that's always appreciated. Um, and uh, with that, if there's no further questions, I would move that the commission approve the local aid, quarterly local aid payments as described in the memo um, from Chad Bork, financial analyst, dated November 7, 2019, included in the commission's packet. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Now, moving on to 5G. Dr. Lightbound. Thank you. So today I have Alice Spiela with the um, Harness Horsemen's Association. She's the treasurer and What's your other title? Managing Director. Managing Director <laughs> of uh, HHJNE um, to talk about um, their uh, pension plans and different things they're doing, benefits for their members. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having Microphone. me. Good morning. Microphone. Good morning, Commissioners, and thank you for having me. Uh, welcome to Plainville. This is my town. I live here. My husband and I have had a farm since the end of 79 and went on to sell the first farm and buy another 60 acre farm and he being local four by trade built a training track uh usta regulation training track in which um uh another farm another stable shares use of that track with all of us so i'm very comfortable here more so than boston <laughs> and i just wanted to meet with you to kind of bring you up to date um throughout the year i've been trying to do that uh, I wanted you to see uh, our first year. This is our first um, year, uh, actually our second year, but our first year of really promoting it and getting people going on that RSP. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see we increased our participants from 112 to 141. Mm -hmm. It has been a big, big hit amongst the trainers and drivers. Mm -hmm. So much so that it's probably part of the fabric that's making racing work over at Plain Ridge. Uh, the criteria, the adjustment we made in the criteria because of the la less racing days has worked really well and it's allowed them to participate the way it was intended. And our membership has over the past three years um, also increased from when I came on board. Um, there was 256, we're now at 333 members. So we're really um, growing strong and um, the Harness Horsemen's Association had an election in which all the same people were reelected and the president. They felt, the membership felt strongly that they were being well represented. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to let you know what some of that money's doing besides the pension. We also have, um, what we offered this year, first time, was a company, we teamed up with a co company called 2020, and we did a vision program for them and they brought a bus, oh, we're, I'm sorry, I'm not following your order maybe. Uh, they brought a bus to the, um, to the facility right. and the people were able to come in and have eye exams and um, the uh, Health and Welfare Fund was able to help offset that cost so people who would not normally be able to go get an exam or afford the glasses, um, maybe wouldn't even put the time, didn't have the time, we made it really easy for them. So we had sent out a um, bulletin letting them know we were gonna do that. And I believe you received a copy of um, a kind of um, frequently asked question page we put together for them. And um, it was a big hit. Everybody seemed very satisfied. So that's the kind of things we're trying to do. Um, vision, maybe get into some wellness checks, flus, things like that. We've got some big ideas that we want to work with um, the members and use that money for. 
and also not that it's part of the health and welfare but just we wanted to give a little shout out to the fact that we were able to get um, Tufts to offer our members a discount up there um, if they need any services and that's the summary that's so, exciting stuff again it's it's what I referred to earlier is just growth and success on the, the harness racing side of the business that uh, uh, and it's all it's really because of the legislation with the health and welfare fund mm -hmm. that this is possible and um, there's just endless possibilities we're trying to put together for them and we appreciate that yeah I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Stebbins that this is fabulous program um, I see how hard you work every year to improve it. This is an excellent. I love the frequently asked questions. Yeah. That's really helpful to people. You know. Um, also, why are our, and looking at those numbers of other states and our state, our numbers are so much higher, right? That first chart we showed, um, is that just, do you think it is the, um, is it the pension plan that, that people really gravitate around becoming members, or is it just the, Increase it of racing that definitely was the pension plan that it was. brought members aboard. Wow. And people that I would approach people and I'd say, You know, we have a pension plan. I heard about it. What does it involve? And when I'd tell them, Sign me up. Okay. And um, uh, I just I can't say enough about it. I, I mean, but I do have the, the other side is people are asking me. Um, what do I need to do? Am, have I met my quota? I want to, you know, move on, get out maybe early, go to Florida. I said, well, that was the idea. If you started early in, in April, you put your six out of eight months in, and you needed to leave to head out, fine. If on the other toss of the coin, some people would not be here early, but will stay now. They come up to me all the time. I need to stay in November to get my, my points, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. That's great. Alice, uh, we'll talk, you, you were here. Uh, we were just um, earlier discussing, you know, the um, the uncertainty that comes in January 15, uh, mostly around the thoroughbred uh, racing. But of course, uh, you know, it affects the standard bred if, if should something not be renewed, for example. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent uh, that you're not already doing that, uh, doing the following, or your membership is not uh, doing this. Um, do you talk to your representatives or people at the legislature who might at least you might want to inform about the it's, success story our, on this side? Our focus, um, yes, very big focus. I have to say, I have a brother-in-law who was in the thoroughbreds just passed. Um, I'm so passionate about that. thoroughbreds because I actually started as a groom in thoroughbreds, so I am passionate about the thoroughbreds. I'd love to be able to have them um, here too, and but we are at our legislative level asking for whatever information they need, whatever numbers we can give to them to keep us going because of a program like this. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And that was it. Thank you, Mary. Thank, Thank you. you. I just wanted to just oh. uh, re reiterate how happy we are to get thorough reports from you. And we also really want to um, uh, send our appreciation for close relationships that we all we work together you know, with Dr. Lightbound. It's so important for us to keep those communications um, really uh, strong so that we can make sure to meet your needs and we can help in our regulatory process. So Dr. Lightbound, uh, we, you know, your leadership here is so important and this is all reflective here with these increase in numbers so thank you and thank you I gotta tell you originally I started just to do this plan that's all I came on board to was do the plan and get out and somehow I I became a, a voice for the membership and it's been a learning curve for me because I never had taken that role on I've always been the trainer uh, the owner of the standard breads that was originally why we bought the farm to do our business so I was just part of the masses now I've become the voice of the masses and I have a learning curve and um, I'm looking forward to working together I'm trying to see that we can find that common ground and find the avenues that you take to get there 
Well, it's very important. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. This is a um, request from Plain Ridge uh, for a uh, substitute judge for Plainville. Uh, <clears throat> his name is, uh, let's see here, <laughs> gotta get myself going here, James uh, Traster. Uh, he is uh, accredited with the Racing Officials Accreditation Program as a thoroughbred steward. Um, he, we've talked to uh, the Harness uh, Association, the USTA, about what he needs to do to um, get accredited through them, and they have given him a provisional judge's license with the understanding that at the next um, time they offer the course, to that he will take the course and um, take the exam. So um, he will be um, certified through them, and that also makes him eligible to get the rope accreditation um, for dual breeds. Um, once you've taken the full course for the rope on one side, then you just need to take the um, breed specific sections to get accredited for the other side through the racing officials accreditation program. So um, my recommendation is that the commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino to approve James Traster as a fill-in judge and racing official. Dr. Leipbaum, although he doesn't have, um, this candidate does not have the official uh, he has a temporary uh, accreditation. Right, a provisional. But yeah. you've reviewed his qualifications and uh, you're making assurances um, that he is uh, qualified even though the official certification is in waiting? Right, and what we've done is he's um, shadowed the current judges in the judges stand mm -hmm. and so that um, he could start learning on that aspect of it and then um, he will be, anytime he's on, he would be on with our two judges as well. So right. it would be our two judges and him okay. for uh, whatever races what he was needed to fill in. So you are satisfied that the appropriate uh, knowledge and qualifications are in place to approve this uh, application? Yes. yes. Okay. And Alex, I mean, we have a short amount of time for the racing season left. Is there appropriate time that he would be able to complete certification before the start of next year's race? I believe they're not giving it till sometime in the spring, and I don't know if um, they if that'll be before the um, meet begins or not. Okay. Um, they may not need him as a fill-in at the beginning of the season. This is um, specifically for circumstances uh, right now for this, uh, you know, for the last month, six weeks of the harness meet. Mm -hmm. I understand you do need a vote for this. Is there, are there any further questions for Alex? No. Commissioner Cameron. So I move that the commission approve the appointment of James uh, Traster as a fill-in judge as requested in the letter from Steve O'Toole, Director of Racing at Plain Ridge Race Course, dated November 1st, 2019, included in the commission packet. Second. All right, no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you, Captain. I had a uh, request if, if we have enough time um, to go out of order a little bit. If um, uh, Jason Savistano would like to be able to get back to the track, if we could take the pick in pool um, racing regulation. Mm -hmm. Now okay. and then, I, if the commission, have, we do have 15 minutes, and um, um, Second Director Bajosian, I'm not oh, sure geez. if we have more time for, to even go further. I, I think that's up to the commission. Justin might be, he might also be. I am told the most important thing that lunch is not here yet. So, <laughs> so I, I can we can give you the high sign, and if you want to go until lunch gets here. Can we get a five minute break? Five minute break. For the record, this is exciting. We are ahead of schedule. We duly note that in the minutes. I think um, what I'm hearing from my fellow commissioner is that we would like a five minute break and then we could have uh, move forward on these regulations. Sure. Thank you. So Thank much. you.
Before we start, I real realized that I had not been properly recording, so we had uh, taken a brief recess. Um, I had noted for the record that we were ahead of schedule, which is exciting, but we're ahead of schedule enough so that we can accommodate some of our, our guests and move ahead to item number six. So this is um, now we're reconvening officially. So starting with item six, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lightfoot and General Counsel Blue. Yep. This is just bringing back the um, pick in that Plain Ridge had asked for in the spring, and it's gone through the promulgation process and is now ready for the commission to do the final vote on it. <coughs> okay, moving ahead then with uh, the the pick and pools. Yes. I understand, uh, General Counsel Blue, that you're going to have um, Jason, correct? Correct. Speak on this, and Jason is with playing, or the combination of you and Dr. Lightbound will be presenting on it? No. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, you were very helpful at the public meeting last week explaining it to me, so thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. The um, main feature of the of bet is that it'll um, stimulate a pool of money and it'll grow. Uh, it's hard to hit it. Um, the Getting the full pool is with uh, being the unique ticket that would have it. So if you're not the unique ticket, then you get a portion of the pool. And yes. Jason can expand on Just that. Just like we uh, adopted the a pen effect that we have an effect now, uh, which is the... Just like we adopted the uh, pen effecta, which we have now, which is our wicked high five uh, pool. And it's a jackpot carryover. That's, it's the highest this year it's gone was $55,000. Uh, $55, um, generates a lot of interest. Um, we, we did have a pick five um, at, at Plain Ridge at one point. We dropped it for not having um, enough interest uh, in that pick five pool uh, due to the lack of not having a jackpot go along with it. The majority, if not all, of the other harness tracks have a jackpot um, associated with that particular bet. So uh, we weren't really getting much handle and people are not gonna really bet into a um, uh, a race that has um, $800, $800 in the pool, then minus the uh, takeout, and there's not really much back to go around. This um, now would um, allow us that single unique ticket where half the money bet into the pool on that day goes back out to the public if the single unique ticket is not hit. And then the rest of it will carry over and build a jackpot. Um, at that point so it will generate um, in the beginning it starts off slow and then in, as time goes as no one hits you know f five consecutive winners in a row the pool builds mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're up to a 30 40 fifty thousand dollar pool now you have a lot of interest a lot a lot of interest uh, of the public want having a having a chance mm -hmm. to win some halfway decent money uh, out there. And it's, uh, it's something that I really think that, uh, that, that we should, you know, that we should add. And it's my understanding that this language, because it's complex, mm -hmm. is actually lifted from the rules of the Association of Racing Commissioners International, the exact language? Correct. The, the current CMR uh, has the language up to, I believe, section F. That's currently already in place. We needed to get to move forward with this from section G on. And all of those edits, which are marked in red in our, our materials, are actually exactly incorporated by that association. The Correct. same language, no difference. Correct. Correct. Really helpful, thank you. Any questions for Jason? No, but I do like that we're following RCI. Um, yes. You know, I, I believe, I, I, know, knowing the organization, knowing how much time and effort is spent on uh, thoughtful discussion about how 
how this um, should be um, should be carried out is is important, I think, and I, I do appreciate that we are doing that. Excellent. We just try to we want to we want to stay with the times, if not try to get ahead yes. of them. And no. the consistency, um, because these uh, folks move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, understanding you know what those rules are on a, on a larger level, so they don't have to go from here to Maine and, and follow a different scheme of things, right? So Correct. I think that's important too for um, for the public, for the industry, and mm -hmm. so I do appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I would just note for um, you know for for the record that um, on their uh, prior conversation uh, this morning we were talking about um, Chapter 128D, um, which we have uh, submitted. Uh, some of the flexibility that's embedded in that uh, legislation um, would be really helpful on uh, instances like this. This the request for this bed, for example, came in March, uh, went through the whole promulgation process, we're finding ourselves now approving this, um, there would be, I would submit, uh, a real parallel to what we have done in gaming, have a regulation that's flexible enough and points to rules of the game that can change as the market changes. Uh, even, and, and you know, I, I would, I would um, guess to venture that we would follow a similar deliberative process in terms of hearing uh, mm -hmm. the benefits, the trade-offs, what others are doing, uh, how the market is doing, um, but under that regulatory scheme, mm -hmm. I would say we would have a lot more flexibility to react to things like this. That would be very valuable to yeah. have that ability. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, RCI, they, they do change uh, the rules um, on a, I wouldn't say fairly regular basis, but as new as new bets come, and new bets are in place, and they want to change things and add things. Um, it'd be nice for us to be able to just pick those up r right away instead of having to go through the whole through the process. Uh, well, it's, it's it's a competitive uh, um, issue in my in my opinion. If you are I agree. All, all the all the uh, the betting public is really looking at signals from all other different states, and if you're not able to, mm -hmm. you know, incorporate them here, people are used to others. They'll simply would not. That would result in what you just uh, uh, said to us. You know, you eventually have to drop perhaps a, a, a bet because the interest is elsewhere. And it has nothing to do with your uh, uh, operational ability, but rather the environment that you are operating within. Exactly. Any further questions? It's a two-part um, process. Mm -hmm. Do we have a, a motion? regarding the um, small business impact. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 6.35 pick and pools included in the packet. Second. Second. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Uh, okay. Madam Oh, I'm sorry. There's a motion. Oh, so sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 6.35 pick and pools as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. And just again, I failed to uh, activate my microphone. The earlier vote was also 5 0. Thank you. Moving on, then. Oh, thank you, Jason. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you very much, Commissioners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. We really appreciate it. We appreciate it. your expertise. Thank, thank you. So moving on now, we're going to, I think we have time to go through all of the regulations. Catherine, thank you. So we are now on another horse racing uh, Regulation and Jason, are you leading this? Justin, I, I'm Jason and Justin, Justin. It's the it's a common trip up. So uh, uh, yeah, we have a number. Uh, Doc, Dr. Lightbound and I have a number of racing regulation changes. Um, many of these are ministerial, or uh, and a couple others are sort of streamlining and updating a, a, a number of our regulations. 
uh, starting with the first one in the packet is 205 CMR 3.01. Uh, the change to this particular regulation redacts duplicative link, uh, language concerning appeals of racing decisions and directs readers to the proper uh, appeal section within our regulations. And this is to start. No. To start the, and this is to start the promulgation process, or no, it's an amendment. Okay. I'll, what, what I'll, dra I'll address all the ones in section three first, and okay. then I think we'll, we're going to do a vote on do everything. An, and an om omnibus as to three. Exactly. Okay. So 205 CMR 3.03, .03, the change to this regulation, very similar. It strikes duplicative language concerning appeals and once again directs the reader back to our appeal section contained in our regulations. 205 CMR 3.12. Uh, this adds additional language concerning objections to incidents occurring during a race and gives the standard bred uh, judges the authority on racing interactions that take place during a race. So that's, this is not a ministerial. It would provide them with the uh, ultimate authority to make decisions of actions taking place during a race for a final decision. And just to be clear, that means removing any right to appeal. That's what you mean. That is correct, yes. Okay. And we already have that provision in the thoroughbred regulations. Okay. Um, 205 CMR 3.18. This adds a procedure concerning recusal of racing judges in the event of a conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest. Um, so as you saw earlier today, there was an addition of, an, of another uh, fill-in judge uh, that would help to uh, uh, remove any possible issues if this were to become a uh, concern at some point in the future, but it would allow for uh, flexibility with judging of races if there happened to be a possible conflict of interest. And uh, 205 CMR 3.29. This formally adds a procedure that has already been in practice uh, concerning a quarantine option for horses that were testing positive for an overage of uh, total carbon dioxide in their blood. So it's essentially formalizing an existing procedure we had already. Um, it adds language to that effect. Uh, 205 CMR 3.35, this is a new section that uh, it Being in Hopefully they'll reboot quickly. It's one omnibus, it's one for, omnibus for all the three. And then the other mm -hmm. sections have an individual one. So it'll be omnibus as to anything relative to three. So 3.00. Three point, anything mm -hmm. including 3.00. No. Oh, oh, is included in the packet. Yes. Yeah, I see. I've got it right here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I mean, if you'd rather it individually. Identify also. No, I guess I just want to make sure that we understand that um, that we covered sufficiently the um, more substantive ones. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to ask questions mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the 3.0, at mm -hmm. the conclusion 3.0. We're back I was just about to start a new section. Uh, no, I'll still Should on you go three. back a section? If you could go back one of the sections. Sure. <laughs> I'll just go back to the last one. Okay. Uh, okay. Just in case we were, we were cut off, uh, the last regulation I had mentioned was 205 CMR 3.29. Mm -hmm. This formalizes an existing practice concerning the quarantine of the p option of a quarantine for horses that test positive for total carbon dioxide in blood. So again, this was an existing practice and puts it formally into the regulations. And then I believe the last in section uh, three is 205 CMR 3.35. This is a new section in under section three, but the language is was pre-existing. What this does is it uh, moves the existing language concerning our adoption of the United States Trotting Association rules from the forward of section three into its own section, just so that it's easier to find and easier for those who might be looking for a particular rule to understand that yes, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission does adopt the United States Trotting Association rules, which often concern a lot of the, uh, the granular details of what takes place during a race and what's permissible and that sort of thing. So this pulls that out into its separate section so that anybody who's looking can find it more easily. So, and with that being said, those are all the, the changes in the regulations under 205 CMR section three. I'm happy to answer any questions about 
those regulations at this time. A comment, uh, which is I'm, I'm happy to see um, uh, a formal process here for um, uh, a, a, an official recusing and an alternate judge stepping in. I think it's really important that people recognize that we take uh, conflicts of interest seriously and uh, we encourage um, that, that reporting as well as the ability to bring another official in in cases where um, there's a, a conflict or a perceived conflict. That, and that might be worth uh, going through the process with just a little bit more detail so that when a conflict arises, can you just go through the resolution process, Justin? Please? Sure. Thanks. Um, so what this regulation does is it sets forth parameters that would establish when a conflict of interest does exist between a racing judge and say someone who's uh, someone who's racing in the race. So if there's a family relationship or another significant relationship, it, it sets forth the, the four corners of when a conflict of interest exists. And then that can then it also establishes a procedure by which that person can recuse themselves um, and uh, also a procedure for by which the recusal or the conflict of interest could be waived if it's a if it's if it's disclosed to the to the director of racing director lightbound and she look she examines it and, and says okay we're okay here and also establishes a procedure by which typically we have three racing judges mm -hmm. if one of them has a conflict that person can approach the other two racing judges to raise the issue of a conflict to in, to essentially query whether those two are uh, if they if they would be amenable to going forward without that third judge, which does occasionally occur, um, and, and we don't like to be the normal practice, but if it does occur, there's we now have a procedure whereby it, it can be documented and set forth so that we we know and we know ahead, and we can formally we can formally have on the record that there's there was an acceptance of that. And it moves along. Um, the uh, and there's also the potential for selection of an alternate racing judge because typically it's incumbent upon the person who has the conflict to find a mm -hmm. to find a, an alternate. If they're unable to find find an alternate, you can go to the two judge system. Um, the selection of an alternate judge does then have to be approved by our director of racing, which I think is an important step, uh, so that. It can't just be anyone. It has to be someone we think meets the credentials of being an appropriately uh, educated and experienced racing judge. And I know you spend time every year um, with training for all of our folks, whether it be our regulatory staff, um, judges, stewards, uh, folks at the track. So I, I think this certainly would be appropriate to um, train so that they understand clearly where it is a new regulation, um, how to report, what it's all about, the kinds of things that are maybe perceived as a conflict. Yeah, we've, we've made it a practice to have an ongoing channel communication with all of our judges at, uh, at PPC and every at the beginning of every racing season I make it a point to go down and meet with them at the racing offices and do an initial training about the things that um, can, can rise up to become problems, so hopefully that they don't become problems during that particular season, and also just to give them any updates on any changes, and this would absolutely be one of those that we would go over in detail. Great, thank you. Very helpful, Justin. Any other questions uh, for Justin or Dr. Lightbound on any of the particular regulations, because I understand we're gonna vote as a uh, um, on the whole, for 3.00, with that said, we could carve out anything, correct? Mm -hmm. So, if there's any questions you have on any of the, the regs, okay? Um, I think that you were about to ask the question, or maybe it was answered, this is the beginning of the process, as I understand it, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. Good, yeah, thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. With that said, do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 3.0, specifically 3.01, 3.03, 3.12, 3.18, 3.29, and 3.35. 
Harness race course racing references and annotations as included in the packet. Second. Any questions, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Five zero, thank you. And Madam Chair, I further move the commission approve the version of the amendments to the same subsections just referenced to 205 CMR 3.00, zero, harness horse racing, references and annotations as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero, thank you, excellent work. We'll move on to the next grouping. Thank you. 4.0. The next grouping of regulations deal with uh, 205 CMR 4.0, which relate to thoroughbred racing. The first in uh, these three is 205 CMR 4.01. This proposed uh, regulation change would strike duplicative language, again referencing the appeals procedure, directing the reader to our proper appeal section, which is 205 CMR 1.02. So it's really just redactions. <clears throat> the next uh, in this regulation is 205 CMR 4.03. Again, this proposal strikes duplicative language regarding appeals. Again, directing the reader to the proper appeals section. And then the final one in 205 CMR 4 is 205 CMR 4.3. This propo proposal adds a procedure concerning recusal of stewards for events over which they may have a conflict of interest so it's a parallel version of what you saw in the standard bread that we just discussed this would deal with thoroughbred if the same type of a conflict of interest were to arise in the context of a thoroughbred race any questions for justin with respect to this particular reg any uh, suggested changes again we're just starting the promulgation process okay do i have a motion Ma Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 4.00, specifically 4.01, 4.03, and 4.30, Rules of Horse Racing References and Annotations as included in the packet. Second. Questions? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 4.00, the specific references earlier made, rules of horse racing, references and annotations is included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Uh, the final regulation I have before you today is in 205 CMR 101.02, which deals with appeal, the appeal section uh, to the commission. What this regulation does is it uh, clarifies some of the language concerning the timing of racing appeals. This was this timing information previously existed in the now redacted sections of the past regulations. It's just making sure everyone goes to this section for any and all information on appeals. What this regulation also changes is it streamlines and uh, streamlines some of the discovery procedures with uh, cases of medication overages or violations in the racing context to make it more uniform and standardized so that the process can re uh, resolve more smoothly for the hearing officers and everyone involved in the hearing process. And to be clear, um, my understanding is too that some of the requests that have been coming in were voluminous, taking a lot of time and were in fact slowing down the process as that. we go and that this will keep it to the relevant and material information necessary to move the hearing process forward. That is accurate, yes. That's correct. Any questions for Justin on this? So there's a housekeeping component and a more of a substantive component on this one. Any questions? Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 101.02. Review of orders of civil administrative penalties forfeitures issued by the Bureau, Commission staff for the Racing Division as included in the packet. Second. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Madam Chair, I further move the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 101.02, Review of Orders for Civil Administrative Penalties Forfeitures issued by the Bureau, Commission staff for the Racing Division as included in the packet, and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Questions? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation today, Dr. Lightbound? Yes, it does. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your expertise, and we love being here in Plainville to do horse racing. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. We'll break now for lunch. Um, we are going to be, <coughs> excuse me, reconvening. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you, pardon. Bless you. Um, uh, yep. One o'clock. One o'clock. Yeah. And will our, will our guests be here? We have Christopher Bruce is here, so we could. <coughs> Thank you. My apologies. Yeah. And one o'clock. We'll can reconvene. Thank you. We're reconvening uh, <clears throat> Gaming Commission meeting number 281 here in Plainville Town Hall. We are now on our agenda, and I'm delighted to say a little bit ahead of schedule. So we have now Mark Vanderlinden, our director on responsible, um, our research and responsible gaming uh, director. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Judd Stein and uh, commissioners, and good afternoon. So this afternoon, we're turning our attention uh, to the research agenda. Um, Section 71 of the Expanded Gaming Act um, put a heavy emphasis on trying to understand what the social and economic impacts of, of casino gambling are in the state of Massachusetts. Um, specifically, what happens when you open, a, in this case, what happens when you open up a casino in Plainville, Massachusetts? What are the benefits to the, the community? What are the potential harms that, that um, we would see in Plainville and the surrounding communities? This is really what we're trying to answer here today um, through two different reports uh, that are two different reports that we have, really three different reports. One is the social and economic impacts of Plain Ridge Park Casino and the new employee report. Uh, Dr. Rachel Volberg from UMass Amherst and Dr. Mark uh, Melnick from the Donahue Institute will provide an overview of those two reports for you. Um, and then second, we, we have uh, an examination of four years of operation of Plain Ridge Park Casino. Though it seems like yesterday that, that it opened, we're, we're four years into it, or greater than four years. And um, Thomas Peak will lead a discussion um, on the uh, four years, first four years of operation of this casino. Um, the afternoon, we will turn our attention to what are the public safety impacts of uh, casinos in Massachusetts. And uh, Christopher Bruce will take a look at three different studies focusing on three different um, regions of the state where we have casinos, um, all in very different stages, as you, as you very well know. Um, understanding what crime impacts um, casinos bring to Massachusetts was also an important piece of Section 71. Um, do you see an increase in, in specific crimes related to casino gambling? Um, or as, as Christopher Bruce says, perhaps we will see decreases in, in specific areas given the, a change in the dynamic within each of these 
uh, communities. Uh, Christopher will describe to you um, what his findings are um, after uh, four years for Plain Ridge Park Casino, eight months for MGM, and, and he will describe to you the baseline study for Everett and the surrounding communities. So to kick this off, I will turn it over to Drs. Volberg and Melnick. Am I supposed to? Uh, you just have to speak really close. Just to speak really closely. <laughs> OK. In contrast to the instructions that are here in front of me. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's good a afternoon. pleasure to be meeting with you in Plainville as opposed to Boston. Um, and definitely a pleasure to see this building, uh, which um, I've heard a lot about but have not actually been in before. So let's see. Um, the presentation that Mark and I are going to be doing um, is uh, a bit of a hybrid. Uh, so we had a, a very large uh, summary, um, inaugural summary report that we presented to the commission, I believe, about a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago, which looked at impacts at both the state level and at the regional level. And in thinking about that, that presentation and that report subsequently, um, we realized that there was probably some value in extracting from that report all of the regional impacts, since most of them were specific to Plainville and Plain Ridge Park Casino, and to basically just have a report that's focused on um, this uh, area and the slot parlor. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on the social and health impacts uh, in, that we identified regionally. And then Mark is going to present on um, the, uh, the economic and fiscal side, but with a focus on an updated section that deals with employment uh, at, the, um, at the slot parlor. And then we're going to turn it over to Tom, who is going to present to you on um, a new report that uh, we will be publishing shortly on the operational impacts of four years um, of Plain Ridge Park Casino. So to begin with, um, I'm going to go very, very quickly through some introductory slides. Some of you will have seen these multiple times, so um, they're just to sort of provide some background about the Expanded Gaming Act and why we have casinos where we have in the different parts of the state. Uh, a quick um, uh, slide just to remind you of the importance of Section 71 in authorizing uh, the kind of work that uh, my team and I have been up to for the last six years. Uh, and uh, just a quick overview of the essential elements of the research agenda um, and, and the parts that we have been um, responsible for, which are the baseline study of problem gambling and existing programs, as well as a much larger study uh, to understand the social and economic effects of expanded gambling as those roll out over time. Um, again, a reminder of um, our uh, where in the state the casinos are located and the officially designated host and surrounding communities, just for people who might be watching um, on the live stream or who haven't seen us present before, this is often a, a useful map for people to see. This next slide is a, um, a synopsis of the characteristics of Plain Ridge Park Casino. It is a slot parlor rather than a full service casino with table games. Uh, the next two columns are the host and surrounding communities. Uh, gives you some information about the availability of gambling at the, um, at the slot parlor. And then also um, some notes about uh, the fact that uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino was previously um, a, a racetrack. Uh, the cost of the casino expansion, the size of the operation, and the amenities and ownership. And then a uh, final uh, sort of quick background slide. Uh, we were very fortunate when we um, started this project 
to have as one of uh, the members of our team uh, Rob Williams, who uh, just prior to um, our project starting, uh, had produced a very large uh, systematic review of all of the studies of the social and economic impacts of gambling that had been done internationally uh, from the mid-70s all the way through to 2010. Um, that he and his colleagues identified 492 studies, which they reviewed. Uh, they documented all of the findings of the approximately 200 studies uh, that were actually based on empirical research rather than sort of more theoretical issues, um, and identified actually, amazingly enough, only seven of those uh, studies out of the 200 were deemed to have what's known, what they called uh, an excellent methodology, which was based on specific criteria uh, that they uh, developed. Based on that review, they proposed a methodological approach to conducting social and economic impact studies of gambling uh, that made theoretical sense, that enshrined economic principles and social impact considerations, and was simple to use or at least that's what they said. Um, I'm going to say as the first person to have led a team to roll out uh, this simple to use methodology that it is um, not as simple as you would think. It's actually quite a complex enterprise um, and involves a lot of uh, different sort of hands on the wheel. Um, but it's been my privilege to head this project up for six years and I'm very proud of the work that we've done. So just to review um, some of those methodological principles that we are employing, uh, we like to call what we're measuring impacts rather than costs and benefits um, because the term impact uh, indicates that a change has occurred without necessarily having to characterize it as positive or negative. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of disagreement actually between whether an impact is positive or negative depending on where you stand. Uh, so we just uh, use that term impact. While many of uh, the impacts of gambling are clearly negative, such as problem gambling, or positive, such as employment, um, the nature of other impacts or changes is less clear and somewhat subjective. Um, and so that is the main reason why uh, we um, use this term impact. The uh, traditional approach is to use money uh, to measure and quantify all uh, impacts. Uh, it's appropriate, certainly, for capturing most economic impacts or changes, but it's actually rather inadequate uh, for capturing many of the social impacts since um, social impacts often have no obvious monetary consequences um, and many social impacts are best captured or described um, or, or best captured in a descriptive way a percentage of change rather than trying to assign a monetary value to everything. So one of the biggest challenges in conducting impact studies is that the ability to attribute changes to a specific form of gambling uh, can be quite tenuous. When there's a change in the expected direction that's temporarily associated with the introduction of casino gambling, really all that we can say is that the change is consistent with a potential impact. The likelihood that something is actually attributable to casino gambling becomes stronger when we triangulate this information with the presence or absence of analogous changes in other variables theoretically related to gambling and when other sources of information uh, pertaining to the same variable allow more direct uh, attributions, for example, self-reports of gamblers in the population surveys or key informants who tell us that they see certain things as being the result of the casino, we take that as part of the evidence base that we're building as well. 
So just to uh, turn to the basics of the, of the study overall, um, this is a graphic that most of you <laughs> have seen several times. Um, across the top um, are the various activities that our team is engaged in. Um, the, the rows are timelines, and um, basically you can see that uh, in 2020, uh, we're uh, quite busy uh, because there's activity in each of the um, areas where we are collecting data. So we're clearly past the baseline phase. Uh, we are um, still slightly in the construction phase in terms of um, getting ready to report on the construction impacts of Encore. But other than that, one last report, we will be fully into the operational phase uh, once that report is published. So I'm going to uh, turn now to, uh, the, to the presentation itself. Um, this is a top level summary, very top level, very summary of a much more detailed 80 plus report uh, that will be available probably once I finish talking to you this afternoon on our website so that people um, in the audience or just the general public can access that report along with all of our other publications. So let's begin with the social and health impacts. The social and health impacts uh, part of the project focuses on impacts that are primarily non-monetary in nature. We rely on many different sources of data to assess these impacts. Uh, primary data includes the baseline general population survey, the baseline and follow-up targeted surveys in the host and surrounding communities, key informant interviews, uh, some of the patron survey data also feeds into um, our side of the project. We employ a, a lot of secondary data. Um, much of this data comes from uh, government agencies in Massachusetts as well as federal agencies. And then we rely on the work uh, that Christopher Bruce does uh, to be able to say something about the, the crime impacts um, that we also keep on the, the uh, social and health side, uh, but that obviously have economic impacts as well. So to dig down into the specifics of the kinds of impacts that we have seen in Plainville and surrounding communities, uh, somewhat to our surprise, we did not identify a significant change in problem gambling or related indices that is likely to have occurred as a result of the introduction of the slot parlor in this region. Uh, there was no significant change in the rate of problem gambling or at-risk gambling in the targeted uh, population surveys between 2014, the one we did in baseline in 2014, and the follow-up survey in 2016. Nor was there a significant change between those two surveys in the percentage of problem gamblers wanting or seeking help. There were no significant changes uh, between the two surveys in the percent of regular gamblers reporting negative impacts due to gambling. No change in personal bankruptcy filings in the county uh, that were different from, uh, from previous years. And there were no changes in divorce filings, restraining orders, or number of cases of child welfare involvement at the county level. With these secondary data, sometimes it's not possible to drill down to the local municipalities, so that's why we're reporting county level data here. And this is um, a couple of quotes from uh, two of our key, informant, uh, key informants that we interviewed in 2018, indicating that uh, there did not seem to be uh, any impacts on the health and well-being of the people of Plainville, and that residents have not come forward with concerns about an increase in problem gambling. So that was another sort of triangulating effort um, to make sure that what we were seeing in the survey data was supported by uh, folks who actually live and work here in Plainville. 
turning to attitudes, uh, there was evidence of a significant change of attitudes toward gambling uh, between the baseline targeted survey and the follow-up targeted survey. There was a decrease in the percentage of people who indicated that gambling was not available enough and a corresponding increase in the percentage of people who felt that the current gambling availability uh, was just fine. So um, they seem to be pleased with what they have, but they're fine with what they've got. Um, there was also a uh, evidence of a significant change of attitudes towards gambling uh, in terms of uh, in, the, in the same two surveys, in terms of the state impact, there was a decrease in the percentage of people who felt that casinos would be beneficial to Massachusetts, and a corresponding increase in the percentage of people who felt quite neutral, neither beneficial nor harmful. And then also a change in perceptions of the impact of the casino on uh, the community of Plainville. Um, an increase in the percentage of people who felt that the new casino in their community would be neither beneficial nor harmful, a reduction in the number of people or percentage of people who felt that the, um, that the casino would be beneficial. Finally, in terms of population health, there was no evidence of any change in the health of the population uh, in the wake of the opening of uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino. Uh, no change in the reports of levels of health, happiness, or levels of stress, and no significant change in the percentage of people who reported seeking help uh, for their use of alcohol or drugs or who reported a behavioral addiction. <coughs> So we're going to come back to the implications of the social and health impacts at the end of this presentation, but I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Mark Melnick to talk about the economic and fiscal impacts. Good afternoon, <coughs> good afternoon Madam Chairperson and, and uh, Commissioners. It's uh, good to uh, be in front of you guys again today, and thanks to Mark and Rachel uh, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Mark Melnick. I direct the Economic and Public Policy Research Group at the Donahue Institute, and we are partners with the School of Public Health at UMass Amherst to do uh, to lead the economic and fiscal side of the work that we're doing as part of the of the Sigma project. Uh, let me echo what Rachel had been saying a little bit before about just uh, the pride that we have in the work that we've been able to do over the last uh, six years in this project. Uh, you know, I, I think I say this when, every time I'm in front of you guys, but it's such a unique opportunity when you're um, analyzing an industry when it comes into a marketplace that it wasn't there before. There's very few things that ever exist in such a way that you can say, well, we didn't have this industry and now we do. And to uh, for the state legislature to have the um, uh, the foresight to say let's let's try to analyze all the different elements of impact that might be a part of this uh, it's a very unique uh, opportunity for us as researchers um, and while uh, we get to sit here and, and be the ones that present that to you uh, there's a big group of folks who support us in the background and on the economic side alone there's seven different staff members with areas of expertise so uh, what I'm going to talk about today will be this high-level overview of some of the impacts that we've seen in Plain Ridge Tom's going to step in after and do the preliminary operations report of what we've seen over the last four years. Tom reminds me all the time about what an innovative methodology and how unique this uh, type of work is because of our ability to leverage di data directly from uh, the operators uh, so that we can tell a very complete and full story of what economic impacts look like now and what they would look like going forward. Uh, so the big story, though, when we talk about uh, economic and fiscal impacts in Plain Ridge, uh, in Plainville, and, and how it relates back to Plain Ridge Park uh, in, in, is one that's generally a very positive story. Uh, what we've seen and what I'll highlight uh, in, the, in the data for us is that uh, what we've seen is a unique job growth in, in the city uh, that outstrips what we've been seeing in terms of job growth uh, statewide or in the county. Not terribly surprising when you put a very large employer in a very small place, uh, but still one that, that highlights the fact of, of job growth. Another element of positive that we've seen uh, in the city and region is uh, the, it, it what I'll highlight in the new employee survey in the, la in the latest new employee data that we have, is that uh, 
a large number of folks who are employed by Plain Ridge Park are folks who are either previously unemployed or underemployed. Uh, and these generally are folks with um, much more limited educational attainment than the typical labor force in Massachusetts. What does that mean? What well, highlights the fact that these are accessible jobs for folks. Uh, and so again, another positive element of the story uh, in terms of economic development and economic activity. And the third part I'm gonna highlight is talking a little bit about government and fiscal and what uh, with the uh, infusion of cash for local governments uh, we've seen and we're sitting in an example of that because the resources that were leveraged by Plainville are part of what uh, built uh, this town hall. Um, so first, let me talk a little bit about our analytical framework as we do the economic research. Uh, there's a number of different ways that we can think about theoretically or logically how we put this, put our work together. We generally group it into three main buckets. Uh, I think about it in terms of economic and community impacts, which are more macro level types of things about how a community changes over time. And one of the unique elements of ha having a baseline analysis, but then continuing to track how things are operating. So this could be simple things as demographic changes, population growth, employment growth, um, other socioeconomic characteristics. These are not things that would, would change specifically because of a casino. Uh, or because of any one employer, but are the characteristics of community that would that may shift and have other elements that are related to it. So it tells the story of community. The second element of work that we do is around casino impacts that are much more direct, uh, and we and those are leveraging in a lot of cases direct data that we're receiving from the casinos. Uh, so this talks about direct employment, some of the spinoff economic effects that are associated with that direct activity in the casino. So that talks about you know both direct spending, business to business spending, and then consumer spending that's leveraged through uh, dollars in people's pockets. But then other elements of the casino, like what are the characteristics of the workforce? What types of folks are coming through here? What can we say about patrons who go to the casino and so on? This third element that we refer to as special topics is something that we haven't really delved into uh, uh, yet because we've been doing a lot of descriptive work about the impacts of the casinos directly, but we've seen a lot of questions raised over time as a part of our work on, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to understand a little bit more about what the casinos are meaning in terms of impact on travel and tourism in a community? Um, and I think as we get into a fully operational phase in the casinos, our intention is on all elements of the project, <coughs> particularly on economic and fiscal, is to roll up our sleeves more and try to understand these uh, uh, um, more direct economic effects that, that are happening in communities and, and, related, and, and related industries. So a couple things I'm gonna highlight in this conversation first is around employment. I already teased a, a, a few moments ago that what we've been observing in Plain Ridge to date is pretty robust job growth in the town uh, over the last several years. Between 2014 and 2016, we've seen an increase of about 300 jobs in Plain Ridge, uh, Plainville, excuse me, uh, to a little over 4,600 uh, jobs. That's an increase of 17.3%. Comparatively, the state's grown about 4% over that time period. Uh, Norfolk County and Bristol County have grown about 3.2%. Uh, a good amount of this job growth, as we've been able to observe it, it is tied directly to employment that we see in Plain Ridge Park. Um, there are some limitations to what we can say with secondary data with this because of suppression issues in how state data are, um, uh, are reported back. So they suppress when there's one major employer and one NAICS code. Um, but uh, the aggregate numbers show this growth uh, and, and a lot of it, again, tied to what we would expect to see with a large employer moving into town. So we've seen robust job growth in town. A couple of things that we've seen through um, our mixed methods approach. So we, we've analyzed secondary data, we analyze data that we get directly from the operators, but another way that we've supplemented our work over time is through talking with local experts to understand how impacts are being felt by folks on the ground, especially where we may see data lags. Uh, employment data always has like a year lag to it. So um, what are people saying in real time about some of the things that we may be observing through secondary data? Uh, and so a few things have come out uh, through talking with uh, different uh, local officials. Um, here is a quote from Jennifer Thompson, uh, town administrator in Plainville. That one of the things that the casino promised was they'd reach out to Plainville folks first in terms of employment, and they've kept their word, their largest employer, and that's definitely had an impact. And, uh, and then Lou LeBlanc also noting that employment has been a positive impact so far for the community. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is our new employee survey. Um, so what we do is um, 
interview folks as they are uh, employed by the casinos and ask some very basic demographic questions about uh, first their characteristics um, such as uh, what they've been doing previously for work, what industries they've worked in, where do they live, educational attainment, why do they want to work here. Uh, there's a, a report that's already, that we've been doing this data ongoing throughout the entire time Plain Ridge Park has been open. The data I'm going to highlight for you is for fiscal year 18. Uh, over time, we've added new questions because uh, either we're like, we're like, oh, that would be a great thing to add additionally or th through feedback from folks like, like yourself. Um, but for us, it's trying to understand the characteristics of the folks who, who got jobs here, what their character, uh, what, uh, what experiences they are having, and our goal is over the long term is to continue to track, you know, how, you know, what's turnover look like and these kinds of things uh, as they relate to new employment. Uh, the most notable part, what, the most notable part, which I highlighted uh, at the beginning, was the, lo the level of accessibility of jobs for um, uh, for folks getting employed at Plain Ridge Park. Uh, here, what I have on this uh, graphic demonstrates that of folks who were who were employed uh, during fiscal year 18, what was their previous employment status? What we find is that 51% of uh, were previously employed full time, while 46% were either unemployed uh, or part time employed. Uh, in fact. Uh, so, and then, and so what we're seeing here is that this has been a great element of job creation for folks who may have been lightly attached or unconnected from the labor market. Other parts of this that are positive stories. Of the, 70, uh, of the folks who were previously unemployed, 72% of those uh, went from unemployed to having a full-time job. Uh, and of the ones who were, uh, who were part-time employed, 42% transitioned into a full-time job. So it's a positive story in terms of economic development and access into the labor market. Uh, these data points are very consistent with previous data that we've been presenting to you in the past. Uh, the original new employee survey that we had done, uh, which was, I, I believe, at the one-year mark, uh, showed about 50% of folks were previously unemployed or underemployed. So, um, so this does seem to be a, a trend that we're, but would be something we would continue to track over time. Uh, we asked what industry folks, folks used to work in. Unsurprisingly, uh, the concentration of, of uh, the, the vast majority of folks were co coming from accommodation, food services, retail. What's interesting about this, though, is that some of the industries that are strongest here, accommodation, food services, retail, we see some transportation and warehousing. There's a little bit of manufacturing there. Um, but some of these were industries that were very heavily hit after the recession. Uh, or during the recession and maybe didn't uh, recover jobs as quickly in some instances. So it does tell a story too as well of, of folks who may have been disconnected from the labor market because of economic downturn and now are finding good opportunities uh, in a new industry. A couple of slides that we had to drop because uh, we were trying to be, uh, we were too, too long uh, in the original slide deck, but uh, a lot of the reasons why folks were interested in working in the casino dealt with career opportunity and, in, and increased wages. So uh, the, you know, the first two that we're seeing here, accommodation, food, and retail, are traditionally low-wage industries. Um, and one of the interests in coming to the casino was an opportunity to make more money. Um, next slide here is a map that just highlights local employment and where people are coming from during fiscal 18. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the the majority of, of the workers in Plain Ridge Park are coming uh, from Plainville or other parts of the host and surrounding communities, particularly uh, North Attleboro and Attleboro. Uh, but as you can see, you know, the kind of employment trends really runs along you know, 495 and some of the major highways and the accessibility that Plain Ridge Park has uh, for people in the broader uh, community. Uh, about 62% of the folks that were hired in fiscal 18 were Massachusetts residents, 68, excuse me, 32% coming from uh, other states, Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, I already highlighted a little bit earlier that casino employment uh, is creating opportunities for folks with limited educational attainment. Uh, about 22% of the, of the individuals who were hired during fiscal 18 had a college degree. Uh, comparatively, over 40% of Massachusetts has a college degree about 46% of the labor force. Uh, so what this is highlighting is jobs that are accessible for people with limited educational attainment. Yeah. Could you please say that, um, the comparison again? Right, right, so the, the um, uh, 
percent of the of the Massachusetts population with a college degree is about 40 percent. Uh, workforce is uh, a, a little over 40 percent, approaching 46 percent. Um, so comparatively, there's you know obviously there's quite a bit quite a bit of difference here between the folks who are being employed at the casino. So jobs that are accessible for folks with limited educational attainment. On the government and fiscal side. Um, in terms of impacts, what we're seeing is there are some natural increases that are taking place in terms of government spending. Some of this, you know, uh, services that need to uh, increase police hours, fire hours, these kinds of things, um, as well as extra stress on the roads. These are elements of our work that will continue to uh, deconstruct deeper over time. Uh, but one of the but the highlight from the impact report was that revenues from local aid and the host and, and surrounding community agreements have uh, more than covered for those kinds of costs that we would see in communities. This next graphic here talks a bit about um, gross gaming revenue uh, for each individual year, fiscal 16, 17, and 18, uh, and what that translates back to in terms of local aid. So just focusing on fiscal 18 right now. Um, gross gaming revenue is around 170 million. New state revenue from GGR uh, equaled out to 83.3 million, which led to 68 million in local aid distributed around the state. And the map here kind of shows that that distribution of local aid, uh, which generally um, is formula based and goes to communities with with um, uh, uh, different types of uh, socioeconomic challenges. Um, but we've seen an increase in local aid across cities and towns. And then when we talk specifically about Plainville, um, the host and, uh, and community agreements, uh, we're seeing 1.5 million in property taxes annually, 100,000 in community fees impact annually, uh, and then other elements of, um, of a, a additional annual fee, uh, revenues that come into the, uh, into this, uh, into the town. Uh, and then here, um, Jennifer Thompson's quote, uh, it's the only town hall and public safety building in Massachusetts where not a penny of tax dollars had to be used, which is amazing. The residents were thrilled. The host community agreement we have only used is only used for capital projects. We used it twice, once to buy an open space parcel, so it has preserved 103 acres of open space in Plainville. And the second one is for the town hall and public safety buildings uh, where we are today. Uh, and now I'll turn the the rest of the show over to Rachel. So one of the things that we've tried to do um, increasingly uh, is to figure out ways to quickly and easily share information about the impacts that we are seeing. And so um, we, we have uh, on the, the two columns uh, initially, uh, we have the various um, areas where we are looking at impacts, and then we have the specific impacts that we're looking at, and then uh, we have uh, change from baseline to follow-up. And where you see a level arrow is um, an area where we haven't identified an impact or a change, um, or uh, where we see increases or decreases, we have either arrows pointing up or pointing down. So we, we checked this with quite a few people and it, it, it's a nice way to sort of summarize the data. So what this slide shows you is that there were um, uh, sort of changes in attitudes towards gambling that went both ways, both positive and negative. And there were uh, some uh, environmental impacts that we identified, uh, mostly relating to the increase in traffic. Um, but apart from those two uh, areas, uh, we did not detect any um, significant changes uh, in the indicators that we've been monitoring over time related to social and health impacts in uh, Plain, Plain Ridge, Plainville and surrounding communities. And then on the uh, economic and fiscal side, it's the same idea of how we're showing this graphically. Um, you can see that most of the arrows are pointing up. Uh, there's one that we are still working to be determined, which is gambling participation in relation to income, uh, and one where we did not identify any uh, changes um, that could be attributed to uh, the opening of Plain Ridge Park Casino, which relates to changes in uh, real estate and housing. 
And I'm just going to finish up our part of the presentation by uh, mentioning that we have two new fact sheets uh, that are now posted on our website and will be available for people to download and print. And I have copies for uh, one of, one of uh, this um, fact sheet uh, relates to uh, changes in social and health impacts of Plain Ridge Park Casino in Plainville. Um, the, the majority of the focus is on changes in attitudes, but you can see that graphic there that we also um, included. And the second one relates to the impact of Plain Ridge Park on traffic issues in Plainville. And that's a picture of our team. You can see how many people there are. Mm. And now, I think it's time to turn it over to Tom. Before we, before we just shift to Tom, should we just do a check-in to see if there's any particular questions right now? Um, Richard, remind me, how many um, reports uh, like these for Plain Ridge have, you, have we done? How many reports for Plainville? Yeah, I, well, it, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, you're right that uh, some of us have seen some of these uh, slides uh, before, before, and that's, that's totally fine, good context. I have also, you know, you, you've presented before uh, at times the GRAC, the, the Gaming Research Advisory Committee, um, and I have attended your uh, public meetings. But I'm interested in um, just how many times have, we, have you presented before to this commission on on plain Ridge? I'm not sure I can answer that immediately, Commissioner. I, I would have to go back and dig through my records. I'm going to say it's uh, more than five, but less than ten. Okay. Um, and I guess where, where, what I'm getting is that is um, there are a lot of um, um, data here that is does not appear to be changing. Um, which is perhaps a lot of good news. Um, the way I'm thinking about it is how much do we need to keep measuring oh. some of the uh, indicators that, are, that may not be changing? So I, I think what it's important to understand is that uh, the first either two or three years that Plain Ridge Park Casino was open, there were no other casinos operating in Massachusetts. And we now have MGM Springfield that's been operating for a little over a year, and um, Encore Boston Harbor, which um, has now been operating for almost six months. And I have to say that um, although we have not identified uh, changes to date in what we are looking at in in Plainville and surrounding communities it's quite possible that certainly gambling behavior and some of the social impacts um, and possibly some of the economic impacts will be affected uh, in terms of, of their trends by people changing their behavior with the change in the gambling landscape in Massachusetts um, and and it's I think what one of the most unique uh, features of the study as a whole is that we're looking at both the state level and at the regional levels. And so we're going to be, I think, able to say something over the next few years about what is the impact of a large uh, integrated resort style casino opening in Boston, for example, on the behavior and, or, and, and economics of a small slot parlor in uh, Plain Ridge. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Plain, sorry. Plainville, 30 miles away. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a question that hasn't been, um, we haven't been able to answer it yet, but we are well positioned to be able to say something um, over the next few years in terms of the impact of these regional casinos on one another. Uh, the, the other, um, and I, I, I know the answer to this, but maybe we should, we should just um, um, state a little bit for the record. Some of the data that you present here 
is from 2016. Mm -hmm. Some of the quotes are from 20, early 2018. Um, and uh, one, one of the things that uh, uh, um, I'm interested in as we go forward is having more timely reporting on, you know, on the research that we, that we do conduct. We have a big role in it. There's, we, we, we put you through a research review committee, which takes time. Uh, and I know there's a lot of data collection that goes and quality assurance that goes before you can uh, report it. Uh, but as we move forward, one of the things that I'm most interested in is um, being as timely as possible with, with the information that we're getting um, so that we are, if anything, able to try to react policy-wise or otherwise um, to the findings that we may have. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a, a challenge that we have faced all along um, in, in terms of timely reporting. Um, you know, research takes a while to do. Um, it's um, certainly uh, the review process that the Gaming Commission has established has been um, very rigorous, uh, but also somewhat time consuming. And I've, I've thought about this quite a lot um, in terms of, you know, are there ways that maybe we, I mean, <laughs> What we have to do is we have to come up with ways as a research team to perhaps, you know, raise a hand before we actually have final results that are ready for public consumption. Um, yep. Yeah, um, yeah. So part of what we, we are intending as part of the, the, and especially on the economic and fiscal side of the shop it, going forward is these, um, now that the model has been created and now that there are templates of reports that exist, uh, to kind of get away from the full report and rather do kind of quick hitters on updates of various elements. So whether they function as a fact sheet or, you know, smaller kind of reports, but there's no reason uh, after a certain point that an operations report needs to continue to be lengthy. Uh, because we can always reference the older report and say like, well, the newest year is this, and there's a couple of data points there. And so I think that those are going to be ways in which we'll be able to shave a lot of time off because one of the things that makes a report long is when there's a lot of pages and then people need to read it and there's that whole process. And so what I, what we've proposed, and, and you know, there's just separate from what this presentation is, but I think gets at the heart of your question is next level research is to selectively have longer reports when they make sense. So like if we were gonna do a comparison of operations impacts across the three casinos. Well, that should be a full report. And you know, year six of Plainville, all right, well, let's just do that as a fact sheet. And I think that those are instances where we could be faster uh, and your review process can be faster because it's not the same kind of thing that people are gonna be reading through. We've been sensitive to that, not just on the review side of it, but it's also in terms of the human consumption side of it, right? Because attention spans are what they are, and so to have, we want our impact, our research to have the greatest impact on the most people. It is intended for a policy audience. It's also intended for general public, and the general public is more likely to consume a fact sheet, right? So, so these are things that we've been wrestling with internally, and as you know, we've been having conversations about this on and off for a long time. Some of it has been the production of a product line that has been set in motion a while back, and then, so part of our thinking is, okay, well, when we're fully on operation phase, what does that look like? And uh, so that's some of the thinking and trying to make that more efficient. Yeah, and we're all ears, and I should say, uh, actually, I should reiterate, we have a big role in that. Right. Um, you know, through the through the quality assurance and the review process. Um, but I'm I'm I, this is a good opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, now that we're into the going into the operational phase, to think and rethink those assumptions made early on right. about the cadence, the format, uh, because I suspect, because you already also alluded to early on, there will be other research priorities that emerge, and we, we need to be able to respond to those. Um, we've, we've had those questions, you know, 
to you before, um, you know, maybe a, a perspective from from the city relative to right. tourism, etc. So um, it's really important for us to continue to think about yeah. what. And, and for me, the challenge does that mean? in those exact questions are, is that is that we have created a tracking study that tells stories around employment, characteristics of workers, real estate, lottery sales, all those different things, right? You don't want to lose that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but at the same time, it's like you don't want to keep recreating the exact same things over and over again because, like, what are you learning, right? We've been having you guys ask really important and interesting questions about the care, you know, about what other industries are impacted, other elements of job quality, and so on. So how do you answer those questions while keep the tracking going, right? So that for us has been how do you repackage different um, product lines so that you can still do A in a different way so that you can go and do B. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, so and, and again, conversations we've had in different ways over time. It sounds as though this is something that we can continue to explore because it's important to keep that relevancy um, and, and, and to achieve efficiencies, but I'm with Mark, you would hate to lose the tracking. Right. Um, that would come, when I'm hearing you say that's probably not the most, that's not the, t the, the part of the research and a deliverable that's taking up uh, more time. It's the full reporting and the, and Cor Correct, that. especially when the systems are in place, right? right? You know, so it's, it's the build up yeah. of a system and then moving yeah. it forward. Because that data collection would be, would be too, yeah. Too bad to lose that right now on year four, five, right? I, I think, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with that statement. And if, if uh, by, you know, by doing, using the same data and tracking data over time, we have to, we also have to balance it with what are, with, what are other issues that are coming up That's where right. we want to direct our, our resources towards. Um, and if I could just add one other point about the timeline. We have one, one review, um, so a uh, round of review with our research review committee takes about six weeks. Um, it, would take six, it takes three weeks for our review committee to have, to have it, to digest it, to provide the feedback to our research teams, and then they have three weeks to uh, generate a new, uh, a following draft. And if, it, if there's multiple, Iterations. If we go into round, it, it it's not three weeks each time, but it you can begin to see how long it takes for us to do this type of thorough research review. Um, I don't want to compromise on any part of our research review. Um, we perhaps should take a look at the timeline between um, reviewing drafts and getting it back out. The problem is we have re a research review committee that that's not what they do full time and. Um, they're incredibly good, but um, we need to we need to respect their their time and what they can give to it. Yeah, and and and, and I think I agree that they're uh, they're really good. They're really responsive, but to the extent that you know it's something we've done before, and everybody agrees that the methodology is sound or the format is what it is. At least in theory, you would think you know there would be opportunities there for for that research yeah. review as well. Perhaps I, I agree. One or less, one or more, uh, less turnarounds, maybe mm -hmm. only one. Uh, I know, I, I, I'm familiar with, you know, how, how rigorous that can be and, you know, and comments, et cetera, and, 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 and that's, there should always be allowance for that. Um, Dr. Wahlberg, I think that's I, I just want to add one more thing to the review process issue, which is that in addition to the review committee, um, quite a, quite a few of our reports need to be vetted by the operators, you know, because they're giving us their data, but we need to give them the opportunity to review what we are seeing through our analysis. Um, and that is sort of, you know, also built yeah. into the review process and, and adds another sort of layer of, of complicated interaction sometimes. Well, I just want to make sure that we're not adding a layer of negativity here because this is wonderful research and reporting, but I'm, I'm also aware that there's always opportunity to review and where there can be efficiencies achieved and, mm -hmm. and uh, the methodologies that are agreed upon maybe somehow 
conveyed in an efficient fashion so you're not repeating and reviewing what's already been approved. Just might that, that would work out. But I should understood. we do you have any further comments? Uh, no, just that it is um, you know, the good news here is that mm -hmm. the impacts are not severe. Um, in many cases there aren't negative impacts to what happened here with the Plain Ridge experience over four years. So I just just a comment that that is uh, that is good news, and I think partly attributed to um, the work everybody is doing to um, to minimize those those impacts in, in terms of mitigation yes. and, and innovation. The the one that that stood out to me was on environmental. Can you elaborate on that in terms of whether they're significant or so? In terms of the Traffic. I, I think it was traffic and noise. Noise. Yeah. So um, the the reason that we um, reported that there seemed to be um, an impact in terms of noise was actually a specific comment that was made uh, by Lou LeBlanc, who is one of our key informant interviews. Um, he's um, at at the time we we interviewed him, he was uh, the head of the board of health. And he mentioned that um, there were a number of noise complaints related or during the um, construction phase of the slot parlor, uh, but that there had not been any noise complaints since the construction ended. So, but we felt it was important to document that. Um, and then also through the use of, um, or through an analysis of um, data from traffic cameras uh, around the main intersections uh, in Plainville, we identified, I believe it was about a 14% increase in the amount of uh, traffic um, that was um, going in and out of, of the uh, casino. Not a surprise, um, certainly, given that you have a lot more people coming to the facility. Uh, but we, again, felt it was important to document that as an impact that could be attributed to the slot parlor. So that was an independent look at traffic and mm -hmm. not related to um, Christopher Bruce's work, correct? So in the, in the full report, we look at the traffic data and we looked at, um, at Christopher Bruce's uh, mm -hmm. traffic collision data as mm -hmm. well. Interesting that when we have our meetings with um, the chief of police uh, of the host and surrounding communities, um, uh, there was there was a strong feeling that a lot of the additional traffic was based on um, ways and other oh. other you know taking them off of 495 um, and putting them on back roads. They did not think it was related to the casino. Interestingly um, enough, and that was a. Uh, an interesting piece in talking to all of the chiefs. So I just, I didn't know that you knew that uh, we had um, d discussed that at length, um, the, the traffic issues. So um, that's sometimes where the research and uh, those who are directly responsible having those conversations are very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you. Sorry to disrupt the cadence. Not at all. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm Tom Peek. I am a senior research analyst over at the Donahue Institute. Uh, and a big thing that I've been working on for the last four or five years is uh, sort of developing systems to track uh, the economic impact of the casinos. And um, what I want to talk about specifically today uh, let's see. Do I, how do I get it to my thing? Okay. Uh, I think you might. Yeah, you have to go oh. through it to get it's in order. Okay, this might take a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can just start. Yeah, um, what I really want to talk about is is, um, is sort of what uh, we're calling the direct impacts of uh, of the casinos. Uh, so what are direct impacts? Um, it might be easier to back up and talk about when, when we do um, economic impact modeling. Uh, what we're really trying to capture is everything that's changed in the economy uh, 
as a result of some sort of policy decision or event. Um, when we're talking about direct impacts, we're talking about uh, the sort of primary economic activities uh, that are occurring at the casino. Uh, so what, what does that include? It includes uh, uh, operating employment, so people who are hired uh, at the casino and working there. Um, the expenses that the casino is paying out to vendors and government entities and charities and, and whatnot. Um, it's, uh, it's the revenues that uh, the, the casino is, is bringing in and then some large portion of that is, is then paid to you know, the state uh, government. Um, and uh, those sort of, sort of direct trackable uh, things. Uh, what this is not covering uh, is a lot of the sort of ripple effects that you see in a, uh, in a community like this uh, when there is a, a sort of a big economic event like the opening of a casino. So when you know, we're measuring the compensation uh, that the casino uh, is paying out to its employees. Well, those employees are then going out into their communities where they live and they're spending that money. Uh, we have an, a whole uh, bigger economic modeling uh, process uh, that's capturing those ripple effects. It's also capturing when they buy a lot of stuff from, from vendors. That might cause those vendors to, to invest, uh, to hire more people or to purchase uh, capital goods. Um, maybe the biggest thing is um, when we have uh, you know, a, a thing like a casino that their primary uh, source of revenue is, is, is patrons that are sort of local to the community coming in. It's not like it's a software company that's producing goods for people all over the world. The, the consumer base is local and those people were probably spending their money um, in other places before uh, the casino. Maybe they were spending their money out of state gambling. Maybe they were uh, spending it, you know, at local bars and restaurants. And, and, and a lot of these questions about these things outside of the casino uh, are some of the sort of hottest public policy uh, conversations that surround these things. We uh, have a really great methodology for capturing all of that stuff, but to really, um, excuse me, uh, to really get it uh, working out, uh, we need to do these uh, these these patron surveys uh, that we do, and uh, we at this point uh, are not doing one of those at every casino every year. Uh, we still think it's important to report uh, to the commission on the things uh, that we can get data on uh, every single year, and that's uh, the very rich data set that uh, the folks at uh, Planners Park Casino have been have been uh, very helpful in sharing with us. Um, so let's talk for a moment about data collection. Uh, Tom, Tom yeah. um, maybe you can get to this later, but um, or, or you were going to do this. Uh, why is it important every single year? For me, it's a matter of we want to establish time series data. We want to see how things uh, are changing over time, uh, and we want to see how other events that are happening in state and out of state, whether that's a regulatory event, whether that's a change in the market, uh, how those are coming. Uh, in, in my personal philosophy on data is that you collect a lot of it uh, and you, uh, you then look at it and you see what's going on, but you don't always know what you're looking for until you can take a look at it. And there's actually some really interesting examples in here where um, I'll, show, I'll touch on a couple of them here, and then when this actual full report is published in the next few months, you'll hopefully be able to see a few more of them. There were things that we saw that we maybe didn't set out to look for, and then it was like, wait, how is the, this is going up, this is going down, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and, and, and it sort of sheds light on things that we, we maybe weren't even, um, we hadn't even thought of yet, it's sort of the unknown unknowns or whatever you want to call them. But um, for, so for, for us, it's important that we just, continue to track these things uh, so that we can sort of establish a time series of how uh, these uh, institutions are responding to, you know, the world, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in order to do that, we've actually got this really great uh, data set. Uh, so that includes um, payroll, employment, and compensation at the casino. Um, it includes uh, spending to outside entities, so all of the vendors, um, the government entities, third parties. Uh, we've got uh, data on visitation to the casino. Uh, we've got, obviously, 
uh, the MGC makes available information about gross gaming revenue, um, taxes and assessments, all of this stuff. And, and, and when, we, when we look at these things and, and we compare them to each other and relate them to each other, we're often able to find out um, just really interesting things and help uh, folks, on, uh, you know, such as the commission, uh, to actually answer some, some interesting questions. Um, so, for example, uh, here's a time series we have of uh, payroll employment at every pay period uh, since the start of fiscal year 2016, so about two weeks after uh, PPC opened initially. Um, when we say payroll employment, what we're talking about is employees who received a paycheck during that period. It might not perfectly line up with the number of people there because some people may have, been, may, may have left and they're receiving their last paycheck. Some people might have started a few days earlier. They haven't received their first paycheck, but it's a really uh, rich data set because for each of these employees that's receiving a paycheck, um, we, we know from that all sorts of things about them, about what they were paid, uh, what sort of position they were working in, demographic information about them, uh, benefits, compensation. Um, and because we have this sort of as a time series, we're actually able to, to track a lot of interesting stuff about how people's careers um, you know, change over time and the tenure that people work there and you know, their, how their status might change. And there's a lot of stuff there. Um, but to give you an example of, of you know, this is a, a graph that shows something about uh, payroll em employment. Well, it makes it look like so it was high. Uh, it sort of reached its peak uh, towards the end of uh, calendar year uh, 2015, and then it, it fell and it, it's leveled out a little bit, um, and that's true. But it's also true that if, if you look at um, it from a different thing, um, a, a different perspective, uh, actually, the hours worked at Plain Ridge Park has, is actually higher in, uh, in fiscal year 2019 than it was in fiscal year uh, 2016. So you, that suggests that they might be moving towards having more full-time and less part-time people, and, and uh, that there might be less turnover. Um, so th that's just uh, one example of, of why we want to collect these things sort of as a time series. Um, but yeah, for the last uh, few years, it's really been fairly level, uh, the payroll employment with, on average, about 450 people uh, working, employed at the casino at any given time. Uh, let's see. And in terms of where those employees are located, uh, they're fairly tightly clustered around the casino. When we talked about the new employee survey, you saw that with the new hires, but it's true for a lot of the longstanding people uh, as well. Uh, actually, over half of the folks working at the casino uh, are coming from 10 communities, uh, and those 10 communities include Plainville plus um, all of the surrounding communities except for Rentham, which is, is not contributing uh, a lot of employees, but uh, the, the biggest are uh, North Attleboro and Attleboro. Uh, mm -hmm. On average, uh, North Attleboro has about 51, 52 people working at the, uh, at the casino at any given time, and uh, Attleboro has about 43. Mm -hmm. uh, Plainville, on average, has 24, 25 people uh, who are employed uh, at the casino. There's also a, a, a pretty good number of people uh, in the communities right over the Rhode Island border uh, who are employed and, and come over here. Thomas, on, on this, do you, uh, how do you define Metro Boston and Southeast? If oh, sure. So when we're doing our economic modeling exercises, we have, uh, it's a county-based model. So uh, Metro Boston would be Norfolk County, Middlesex, uh, Essex and Suffolk, it's a very large region, while well, Southeast would be uh, Bristol and Plymouth County. Can you tell me, do you have this, and I may have missed it, Tom, 453 jobs now, do we know the FTE part-time breakdown? It's not in this presentation, but I could easily, uh, it is in the, the full report. Uh, 
I, I could get that off the, top of your head. off the top of the air in my head. I'm not sure. I do but think you the, said that it's increased for full time. Yeah, I, I do believe the number of full time employees has gone up, and I do believe that the majority of employees at Planners Park at this point are, are full time. I think that's always been the case, but it's it's gone up. And you may not have this, but I know that one of the goals for um, taking a job at the casino was increased salary. Mm -hmm. I know. I think we saw that around 50% have gone from underemployed to mm -hmm. um, earning a living wage. Do you, um, <clears throat> do you know if their wages, for those who were full-time, if in fact their wages were higher? Or is this it? We, would, we haven't done this yet, but one thing that I'd be really interested in doing at some point is actually relating the new employee data to the operating we don't have data and to sort of tie those together. We actually, we've been working really closely with uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino and we now have a much richer data set than we've worked with in previous years that would allow us to maybe do some more interesting work like that. Um, but that's, it's not something that we've, uh, we've done to this point. Yeah, that, I didn't think you had access to that, so that confirms. Yeah. Thank you. The You're other probably thing asking a question I've been asking in the past. Yeah, and just to acknowledge um, Lisa McKinney, um, for her immense help in mm -hmm. collecting this data and validating the data and working through some of the, the data problems that we had at different points of time, but to, to assure that what we have is um, is what the, the condition is. So and, and we did have the data. Thank you. I knew I'd seen it, but I couldn't remember. So the breakdown is 301 full-time, 143 part-time. Does that right. sound right? Yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. Uh, one other thing that we're um, we're hoping to to do at some point is um, develop a methodology for estimating uh, income from tips. So we know what the casino is paying, but obviously for some of the employees, they might be making even more than that an hour uh, from from tips. So that's uh, that's an area where I'm really interested uh, in in looking for that, especially when we start doing. Uh, when we start running these things through our economic models, because if they're getting that tip money and spending it in their communities, that leads to an even bigger sort of ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, sorry, expenditure, um, the casino, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about. Uh, jobs at the casino, but in, in terms of the actual money, uh, which is finding its way into the Commonwealth, um, sort of the spending on employee wages is actually a, a relatively small fraction of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, obviously, the biggest um, uh, share of money that's finding its way to the Commonwealth is the tax paid on, on gross gaming revenue, which is uh, very considerable and which has actually uh, grown over the years. Um, spending on, on private sector vendors uh, as well as uh, spending to local, state, and federal governments, whether that's various fees or uh, uh, taxes or, or host and surrounding community agreements, that, that's also sort of spending to outside entities has remained relatively stable, but again is a higher uh, share of, of spending than um, employee wages. Uh, in total, when you know, so obviously 100% of the GGR tax goes to the state, and then some share of the spending on you know vendor spending and employee spending goes to individuals or entities within the Commonwealth. But some of the uh, employees and some of the vendors aren't here. Uh, when you calculate it all up uh, in fiscal year uh, 2019, uh, we're talking about 135. Point two million dollars in in spending, and eighty three or eighty six point three percent of that uh, is actually going to either the Commonwealth of Massachusetts itself or entities or individuals within the Commonwealth, uh, and that share has remained over eighty five percent consistently uh, throughout the four years of operation. It's interesting to note spending on employee wages has climbed. Uh, even though employment has kind of mm -hmm. leveled off. It's spending on employee wages as well as hours worked. Uh, and there's, yeah, we, ha we have a, a little bit of, we have some ideas about that that might be uh, sort of settling into a more uh, incumbent workforce where you have mm -hmm. people who have been there longer, uh, 
sort of where you people are trusted. Either there's people who are being promoted or uh, people who started part time who are now working full time. Um, so we're, we're yeah, that, that's what we are seeing is uh, actually really specifically uh, in in FY19 hours worked and and uh, and compensation have both increased. Thank you. Um, talking about vendor spending, it's a pretty diverse uh, field of uh, industries that are receiving some amount of, of vendor spending. The, the largest uh, of those industries is, uh, is wholesale trade. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, wholesale supplies coming through the casino, particularly related to uh, sort of the restaurant and, and bar side of things. Um, but really, most of the uh, operating uh, expenses are going to industries that aren't in our uh, top ten. So we're talking about a, a very diverse um, field. Um, and when you break that down by in-state versus out-of-state, uh, you'll see that uh, the this is where where uh, the amount of money coming into Massachusetts has, has declined a little bit. The the share of uh, of money, or uh, the share of vendor spending, which is going to vendors within the Commonwealth, ha has dropped off a little bit uh, in the last fiscal year. Um, while the amount uh, out of state started very high, dropped off, and has crept up a little. Um, a lot of that really high initial uh, spending had to do with. Uh, the miscellaneous manufacturing uh, industry, and in fact, it still is uh, one of the things in the min miscell min sorry, miscellaneous manufacturing industry is uh, gaming equipment manufacturing, which is largely done in a couple, largely mainly Las Vegas. So uh, that's where a lot of that is, uh, but it still remains fairly high. Can I um, interrupt? Yeah. Um, I believe we saw a slide earlier today that indicated a good part of the out-of-state spend goes to New Hampshire. Do you remember that slide? Mm -hmm. um, did, you, do you, did you detect that in your research where, because uh, I understood if it's yeah. gaming manufacturing where we would have a hard time competing with those other states. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a sense as to anything that's not related to gaming where Massachusetts is, is losing out on opportunities because either lack of supply or not are being too costly? Is there any trend that you were able to detect on that? I'm not sure about a specific trend, um, or and I'm I'm not sure about New Hampshire specifically as a state. Uh, I haven't I've done sort of state by state analyses in the past, but in this year that wasn't something that I I really sat down and and, and looked on. Um, I do know that you know when you have casino operators who are national or multinational, in some cases, entities, uh, they sometimes have preferred vendors for certain things like financial services, uh, who, who they're already working with, with some of their other properties. Um, but I'm not positive uh, what is specifically related to New Hampshire. What if I can help, and maybe someone can correct me. My memory was that um, Plain Ridge redid some of their procurements. And it was a food vendor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they shifted from, uh, is it Cisco or something, to someone in New Hampshire, which accounted for the swing. And that's like a good portion. They were yes. Well, that was, so it right. was. Right. That accounted for the New Hampshire. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. You know what? We really, with respect to one vendor. Oh, we, we should yeah. point out that maybe some of that data is not yet captured because you're reporting as of fiscal year 19, mm -hmm. and we get from um, from Plain Ridge, we get the most up to date. Yeah. Right. So in, in, in the past, we've demonstrated this sometimes with a map to just showing where different things are. Now. I don't know. If I don't recall this in the slide deck or not. But this is a good reason to track this on an annual basis too, or at least on a, on a regular, on a, on a pretty regular basis because it can tell you a little bit about, like, like at, at different points in time, like, is this really going down? Are we missing something in the state competitively? Or is there some other story to tell about, you know, somebody who used to be in Mass and isn't anymore or something? Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see what's next. Um, so in terms of revenues, uh, I think 
uh, you all are probably very familiar with all of this since, since you publish it, but um, you know the, the revenues have uh, have continued to be uh, fairly strong. It, it it almost looks to me like there was a little jump there, where the first two years were very similar to each other, and then it it popped up a little um, in terms of uh, sort of the, the annual totals uh, per fiscal year, uh, but. Overall, we are not seeing, uh, even with the, you know, the one thing we were really interested in this year was how the introduction of uh, MGM Springfield was going to affect uh, the, the gross gaming revenue numbers in, uh, at PBC, and, and obviously we haven't seen uh, a significant effect yet. Um, but we actually, one thing that we kind of did is we, we looked at, um, revenue numbers and employment, which I showed you earlier, and this is sort of where I think we do add a little bit of value is, well, we add a value in a lot of ways, but this is one where I think, I, I, think I, I specifically, uh, Good pivot. I, I, this, is one, this is one thing that, that we can do that I think is, is kind of cool is that we can actually look at these things and say um, that, you know, m sort of monthly employment at the casino uh, has over time uh, fallen uh, to some extent, uh, but we also see at the same time uh, that gross gaming revenue has, on average, risen, um, which suggests to us that we're talking about a more productive workforce, um, where individual uh, employee, like per employee, they're bringing in a more revenue than uh, than they previously had, uh, which I think you could sort of expect for a new entrant in, into a market where you're, you know, the first year or two, you're going to have to do a lot of sort of building uh, sort of industry specific skills. And then over time, uh, you're going to see individual employees uh, being able to, uh, to bring in more revenue per employee. And, and that's what we've seen here. So it's not exactly shocking, but it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and it's the sort of thing where this data is, is really valuable because most just standard economic models would assume sort of a fixed ratio between productivity or you know, between uh, like output and employment. So you'd say, oh, well, if the, if the employment isn't what it was at the first year, then that must mean that the output isn't. And that's not what we've observed here. So these sort of data allow us to, to sort of model things in a much more comprehensive way. One thing, if I can interrupt you, that I think will be interesting over time is to see how that ratio looks with the other casinos. Um, because one of the things that we're seeing is a maturing casino labor force in the state, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. how, so will we see a trend that looks like this, or will it look more consistent out of the gate? Especially as we see some level of um, Flexibility between the casinos with with you know staff working in one and then ending up working at the other, like will that will that translate into some level of consistency in the gates or not? Yeah, and uh, sort of on the flip side of that, uh, if we track um, operating revenues against visitation, uh, we see the same thing where visitation at PPC has um, has declined a little bit over the four years. But again, on average, the operating revenues have, have climbed. And this is one of the reasons we're really interested to continue to monitor patron behavior is, you know, one thing that this could be an indication of is that we're seeing uh, the population who is going to the casino uh, shifting to uh, people who are less coming in just because they're curious and, and more folks who are spending a little bit more money per visit uh, because you know, you've got less folks, but more money. Um, How much does inflation would factor in here? I know it's only a couple of years. You know, I don't think it, it probably... Or, or, or lower minimums, you know, the business model, uh, higher uh, minimums. I guess that's, that, that's a possible, like, yeah, if, if, if minimums have gone up, that, that could definitely uh, also play a role, for sure. Or slot hold, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely things internally uh, in terms of how the cas casino sets its own rules uh, that could uh, that could lead to this mm -hmm. as well. 
Uh, but it's just these are the sort of things where I think it's it's really interesting uh, to sort of continue to, to monitor these things because this is a trend that we didn't even think to check. We just looked at these numbers and these trends independently, and then you, you pointed out this is interesting. These are going in different directions. It's not what you necessarily would expect. So, so it's something that we intend to keep an eye on. But I think these last couple of slides kind of point to what we begin to learn about the gaming industry, which is after three, four years, you hit the steady state of operations, right? Employment starts to level out, revenues start mm -hmm. to level out as our licensees get to know their customer and get to know how their operations can operate more Absolutely, efficiently. Yeah. But <clears throat> that's, that begs the question. That's why we do need to continue to be consistent so we can really see um, that it's not just a, a four-year steady, but a a longer what would be the number of years to really know the, is it a 10-year trend that becomes clear or if this state mm, that's a really great question um, yeah. it's it, yeah and it's it would be nice if there was an easy answer to that you know because I, I think one of the things that's unique about Massachusetts the strengths and weaknesses of the way this has come together is there was all the spacing of when the casino is actually open so should we expect this level of consistency? So for us, from a research perspective, we were able to disentangle the casinos very neatly and develop our methods very cleanly. The negative in terms of like, so when's the, the, the equilibrium hit or when's the stability hit? It's like, well, the elements where stability hits is when other major casinos also happen to show up. So, you know, I, I, so it's a little hard to say like, well, once, we're, once we hit year 10, this thing should be very predictable. It might be, but I, I, I hesitate to say that, knowing that well, we just opened a massive casino just up the road. You know, so like, what is that going to mean? That kind of stuff. Or, or there's other things. How is online gaming? Is that developed? Like, how is that going to affect these demographic change? How is that going to change? We don't always even know what um, what we need to be looking out for until we see the changes, and then you start looking into them and saying what's this all about How, what's what's the story here and, and and that's i mean that's the sort of stuff i really love to do that's great i i would add i don't want to and i know i've brought this up with mark and rachel and with uh mark vanderlin and um again going back and revisiting the possibility of looking at some ingrained data sources uh and we've talked about this you know a lot of it is locally based meals tax, hotel tax, stuff that's collected locally because mm -hmm. you know, as we saw in Western Mass, Northampton was very concerned about what the opening of MGM would have on, uh, on their kind of restaurant and hospitality scene. And it'd be a great picture, a great story to tell if we could say the introduction of gaming has actually not impacted or perhaps boosted some of those local numbers because that would get to, you know, certainly interest on behalf of you know, the communities are designated surrounding communities, but it also tell a bigger story about people are coming, people haven't really changed, maybe their spending habits, maybe there's more people coming to the region. Uh, and that's data that's pretty readily accessible, but would certainly sure. help us maybe calm some fears of some of the local communities to, to have that data analyzed and looked at. So this is the, that's my presentation. Um, if there's any other questions, I'd really be happy to answer them. Very, very helpful. Thank you. And I echo um, Commissioner Stebbins' thoughts on the local taxes. I don't know, Mark, how we can get that information maybe sooner than later before too much time has passed, but certainly it would be interesting to see the trends associated with events that are coming into our destination casino licensees and see the uh, the local impact so mm -hmm. and, if I could, and we we are exploring different elements of that there are some issues with um uh to the question that bruce is raising with um uh, i'm sorry what's the office it's the um taxation office dr dr yeah, yeah so with dr, DOR you, 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 there are some challenges in terms of how data are able to be disentangled at, at point locations mm -hmm. but municipalities are a little bit different things so, so there are, we are, are doing some exploration with it but there are obviously confidentiality issues that run into some of that. 
Yeah, I think with respect to the municipal, you're actually thinking how much hotel uh, uh, food and beverage and hotel yeah, taxes I mean, how generate. That so there's no privacy local, issues there. Local, right. Yeah, certainly mm -hmm. with respect to individuals, DOR would be, yeah, that would be sure. challenging. And, I, and, and, and again, this kind of is to a bigger conversation that we've had is how can we take the great research that's been done and share it out with a broader group of stakeholders so you know this information isn't just being exchanged between us but it's helping educate the public it's helping educate the local chamber of commerce about how much is being spent locally it's understanding the local impacts um, the local employment um, you know even when you go out and do your visitor uh, patron surveys that's great information to be shared back with the travel bureau as to hey this is why I keep coming back to PPC or to Encore or to MGM so um, I know Mark's really thinking about that day and night but <laughs> and, and by the way I, 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 certainly I should know that they um, there's a great estimate that they do they do get to through the Remy modeling and other things uh, relative to those multiplier effects uh, and whatnot what uh, what you allude to, which which they also responded to, um, has other difficulties because of how data is aggregated at the municipal level. Yeah. But to the extent that it can be continued to be estimated or at least uh, you know put into the context with with other data, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it very Thank much. You. Thank you. One for each Thank of you. you. I'm going to start with these. Awesome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So this is 10 and 11 of our fact sheets. Um, and, uh, please enjoy. Oh, and, and at this now. at yes. this time, I Sorry. think we'll take a, a five minute break before we start with um, Christopher. Uh, Christopher Bruce. Thank you. Oh, I got. I go like this. We're reconvening uh, commission meeting number 281. And we are uh, now on our public safety reporting from Christopher Bruce. So thank you, Director Vanderlinden. Do you want to make the introduction? Sure. Uh, the, just one comment. I introduced his work just a, um, before the uh, Sigma team. Um, and to uh, Commissioner Stebbins' point of, of taking uh, the wealth of information that we have through this research and assuring that it reaches the right stakeholders. Um, knowledge translation is is, uh, is kind of how that's defined. And I think that the work that um, Christopher does um, and his close work with each of the local police departments is exactly that. It's intended to be this type of monitoring system where it's engaging, didactic, and um, and reaches the right audience. Um, it and uh, and so for one, I, I think this is fantastic work, and I applaud Christopher's sort of due diligence of making sure it gets to the right people and working with the right people. So, with that, I'll I'll turn it over. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I think this is the first time that I've been in front of you speaking about multiple studies at the same time, so I tried to um, uh, condense them as much as possible so it wouldn't go on forever. And I think you're pr pretty familiar with my methodology by now, in which I'm extracting the data directly from the, the record systems of the participating agencies. Uh, so that we have not just, you know, summary data, counts of crime, but actual uh, information about each individual offense and call for service and uh, person involved in crime so that we can check for changes in quite a few uh, variables. That, um, that process uh, went very smoothly in Plainville uh, and in, in the summer, uh, Springfield area. Uh, it uh, ran into a few snags in, in the Encore area uh, with one agency choosing not to participate at all and a couple of others having difficulty providing the data exactly how um, I was used to getting it. Uh, but um, I think it'll be, it'll be okay in the end. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those issues when we get to the, the Encore uh, study. Um, and I wanted to talk briefly about the statistical methods uh, I, I've been using. I, I've deliberately kept them somewhat simple uh, because I wanted them to be understandable to the audience, which, of course, to me is principally the agencies that are involved. Um, I think I've sh you know, sh 
covered them before, but just to, to, to go over it again. What I'm trying to do really in, in all of the, the studies is to identify a, a window uh, of numbers in which we would expect each crime or call for service to fall if nothing had changed in, in the community. Uh, and as you might imagine, some crimes fluctuate, you know, and every crime fluctuates a little bit from year to year. Uh, some fluctuate a lot, some fluctuate a little. Uh, and the, the, the amount of that fluctuation determines the the width of that window, I suppose. Uh, so one method of creating that window is just to look, uh, as this example shows you, in sort of the general central tendency of the, the crime over the, the previous uh, period. Uh, in this case, the crime hasn't been going anywhere, it hasn't been trending up or down, it's just fluctuating around that, that central line, basically. And we establish, uh, statistically, with standard deviations, a window on either side. Uh, of that average where we would expect the activity to fall again if nothing uh, had changed for the community. Other times you have a situation like this in which you know the, the numbers over the course of the previous period are trending downward clearly. So if I used the, the standard, the, the central tendency method to establish a window, it would be predicting um, the past essentially, not uh, not the future, and so we have uh, different methods that are based on the trend line uh, that runs that, we, that can run through the data to create the window there. Regression analysis, basically. Again, I've tried not to use statistics that are too complicated for this. Um, just to make it more understandable to the audience, although there's going to come a time in which once we have data from all three casinos and we try to answer the macro question of what impact do casinos generically have on crime and public safety, that it's going to involve, have to involve a lot more sophisticated statistical modeling, I think. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. So the important thing is to understand when you see a statistic in any of the reports that has you know a dash in between two numbers that's the window that I predicted either based on one of the two methods uh, depending on whether the crime was trending or not and then we compare it of course to what happens what really happened during that period to see if it's inside or outside that window so we'll start with um, uh, Plain Ridge Park area here and uh, the major findings over the four-year period um, since Plain Ridge Park opened uh, have been that uh, the violent crime has been trending upward, but not in a way that I can tie specifically to the presence of the casino. It's mostly related to domestic violence, uh, as we're going to see, that um, uh, has seems to have been going up on, for its own reasons. Um, incidents at the casino itself generally led to Plainville itself experiencing a 7% increase in property crime, a 9% increase in total crime, and a trivial like 1% increase in, in violent crime that I, I didn't even bother to put on the slide there. Uh, so it, that's at the casino. That's at 301 Washington Street. So if, if, if that facility had not existed, you know, th those crimes uh, likely would not have existed. Uh, and therefore, that's the specific impact on Plainville itself. In the surrounding uh, region, uh, arrests have been way down for the, the six participating communities, mostly in the area of liquor-related uh, offenses. Uh, that uh, has a lot to do with changes in policies for protective custody. Um, crimes that I think that might be related, or incidents that I think might be related to the casino, I have to do with a credit card fraud, but only during the first year. That, that fell away after the first year. Uh, also during the first year, a little bit of, of I, we're talking about single digit numbers, of uh, disorderly conduct, uh, liquor related disorderly conduct across the street in Plainville Commons. Um, traffic collisions on feeder roads coming into Plain Ridge Park, particularly Plainville and uh, North Attleboro for those. Uh, loss, and then a, a bunch of related stuff that is just related to volume in an area. So uh, lost property, suspicious activity, people complaining about traffic, erratic driving, you know, parked cars, things like that. The more people you bring to a community, the more those types of, of calls for service uh, tend to increase. And Plainville was the only one that really had a consistent increase in all of those things over the four-year period. Now, for the first time, there's two things in this report that weren't in, in past reports. One has to do with drunk driving, and what, we, what I'm characterizing is, is a mild increase, uh, or at least a mild increase caused specifically uh, by, by Plain Ridge Park. The fact is I can't separate the, exactly what's caused by the casino, what's caused by other economic growth in the area, and that's a that's a theme that that's going to run throughout this this presentation, and it's going to continue getting 
hazier going forward how much we can credit specifically to the casino and how much is related to the general economic growth of the area of which the casino is a part. But uh, we're also seeing expansion of the outlets. We're also seeing expansion of uh, Patriot Place. And um, th those, the, the impact of those is tough to differentiate from the impact of, of Plain Ridge Park, if that makes sense. Uh, go ahead. Quick question. Yep. Um, with the um, drunk driving. Yeah, um, I have some more stuff on that. Come oh, down. you do? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll wait then. Okay. Um, some things that are increased that are happening around here that I don't think are related to Plain Ridge Park, but that we've talked about it with the chiefs anyway. Again, um, the increase in domestic violence, uh, mostly in, in the relation uh, in area of simple assaults, so uh, assaults without a dangerous weapon or without significant injury, and what we call family offenses, which are generally restraining order violations or um, child neglect uh, calls. Uh, those have been trending upward in most of the communities uh, around here, uh, Mansfield, uh, I think, the, being the exception. Um, but a, every time we look for any casino relationship, we, we can't find anything. There's no nothing in the narratives that indicates a gambling motivation, um, a, for any kind of um, ca casino-related motivation, which, you know, I could imagine a scenario in which those were contributing factors uh, that led to sort of a general, uh, I don't know, increase in, in angst and frustration uh, among a community that might then lead to, to violence, but I would expect it to show up once. You know, I would expect to see gambling uh, mentioned, you know, one time from a victim's narrative about why, uh, you know, uh, her husband had, had become violent or something like that, and it, it's just not showing up at all. And, and the fact is, I you wouldn't expect that type of trend to be so geographically localized anyway. So I, it just appears to be a, a more general increase in domestic violence. And, and uh, Chief uh, Alfred has uh, you know, talked about general economic um, or financial um, woes that might be causing that that don't necessarily directly have to do with the casino. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the, the opiate uh, epidemic as well. Excuse me. Uh, we've seen increases in fraud and identity theft. And the trend for the fraud incident seems to be a lot of telephone fraud, people getting calls uh, from uh, fraudsters claiming to be from the IRS or claiming to have their family members and, and you know, wanting to, uh, to extort ransom money. Uh, but these types of things are increasing all over the Commonwealth. And uh, again, these, it's not something you would expect to be geographically localized. You know, a fraud out in the street, sure, but not, you know, when you're calling a residence, there's no reason not to call any place in the U.S. if, if you are motivated for, for gambling funds. So um, I, I don't think they have anything to do with the presence of Plain Ridge Park. Uh, just a few examples of some of the, the crimes and calls for service. The, the general story I, I want to convey here is that the types of things that people generally fear might increase from the, the kind of facile, uh, direct causal uh, hypothesis of somebody's motivated for gambling money, so they go out into the area community and steal things in order to, to meet that, that need. Those are the, specifically the types of crimes we have not seen increase. So robbery, burglary, um, thefts from vehicles, auto theft, things like that have all been uh, decreasing in the area. Burglary, enormously so. I mean, if, if I looked at that number and I hadn't collected the data specifically myself, uh, I would I would seriously question that number. I, I, I would assume some there was something else going on with, with reporting uh, for that figure. But all, all across Massachusetts, burglary is decreasing, and it, it's quite a lot in this area. Um, we also haven't seen decrease uh, increases in uh, uh, the other hypothesis would be that vice crimes would increase, drugs, liquor, you know, things like that. But we haven't seen any evidence of that either. What we really have mostly seen the evidence of is vol uh, crimes or calls for service that are related to the volume of activity in the community. And, and those are where we've seen the most increases, like in, in traffic collisions, as you can see there. Um, Traffic collisions, I have to mention, though, were already on the increase before Plain Ridge Park opened. And um, they actually dipped a little bit in, in 2017, at least based on the, the CAD data from uh, the agencies. Oh, I'm sorry, no, no, that's based on, I'm sorry, that's based on, on state crash data, um, which we don't, they haven't closed the years after 2017 yet at the state level, so I can't, I can't give 2018 uh, just yet. Um, so. Even if Plain Ridge Park contributed to um, 
the number of collisions, it was already an increasing trend. So their, their contribution was fairly mild. And, and that jibes with a couple of reports that have come out of um, a, a traffic engineering firm that the casino uh, hired themselves uh, that, that issued a couple of reports that, that have basically said that, that the contribution of the casino has been minor and in minor collisions, right? So mostly uh, you know, fender benders, rear end collisions, and um, almost not even noticeable in, in sort of a dated, in congestion in day-to-day -day traffic volume. And, and I think that that's, that's probably the case. Uh, when you look at the police calls for service for traffic collisions, they're increasing more than reportable traffic collisions. Now there's only reportable when it exceeds a certain dollar value or when injury has happened. So that suggests that most of the increase is in non-injury uh, minor dollar value uh, crashes that um, uh, are contributing to the, to the trend. Um, so to get into the, the alcohol thing, I'm sorry, I thought you signaled Mark. Uh, to get into the alcohol uh, thing, I thought I saw your hand or something like you wanted to say something. Okay. Uh, so the question of, of, of alcohol-related collisions, um, there's a few pieces of evidence that, that are showing up in the last, or that I've, I've collected in the last year that we hadn't had access to before. And the first is the last drink um, statistics from the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission. Uh, th this is collected during adjudication for, for drunk drivers, and th they specify where they had their last drink. These are the figures for Plain Ridge Park. As you can see, it went from one to two to nine in 2017, and then back down to three in, uh, in 2018. Uh, at the same time, I'm looking at collisions that have alcohol as a causal factor. Now, the specific fields where you're supposed to collect that uh, in, the, in the police systems uh, are not filled out with enough fidelity that I trust that data. But what I can do is look at calls for service for traffic collisions that then led to a charge for drunk driving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that gives, you know, I think, a pretty good proxy for the number of, of traffic collisions that were caused by drunk driving. And that's, that's these statistics here. Now, in the can report- Can I ask you one question about that? Yes, have you, sure. Have you gotten the last call from the court system, or are you getting it from the ABC? I'm getting it from the ABCC, yeah. Does the court system provide it discreetly? that you could get it from the court system, or does that have to be, did they forward it to the ABCC? They forward it to the ABCC. I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware that I could get it directly from the court system. The ABCC is the one that always issues public reports about the data. Mm -hmm. So that I went, that's what I, who I went to. I, I haven't even, didn't even try to go to the courts, to be honest. And then your presumption is that it comes from the court, or is it coming from the well, court? Well, according to the ABCC's definitions in their, in, in their public release reports, okay. that's where they're getting it from, yeah. Okay. Um, it, it explicitly doesn't come from the police reports during during arrest, which might collect it and might not. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, you can see from from these statistics, during the first three years, the numbers were a little bit inconsistent. So, in 2016, Attleboro uh, was well within the. The, the predicted window, Foxboro was below it, Mansfield was above it, so was Plainville, Rentham was within it, and the total was well below where we would expect it to be. 2017, the opposite, uh, took, well not the opposite, it was actually still within the window, but um, it was towards the higher end and a couple of the communities were above the predictive window. 2018, it went back down. 2019, it went back up again. So. The, you know, when I looked at it in 2018, I had two years in which it was lower than average, and uh, and only one that it was not even really above the windows. So only in 2019 did it did a, a clearer trend uh, come out of the data, I suppose. But then mixed with that, the ABCC data, I, I think the story is telling. There is a subtle increase in drunk driving in the area that is leading to a few more crashes. Now, I don't want to attribute that to Plain Ridge Park exclusively because. Patriot Place, the different bars and restaurants there contribute uh, over 100 um, last drink locations in the same period that uh, Plain Ridge Park had, um, looks like, uh, 15. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not just PBC, and PBC at best is only uh, re responsible for uh, ten, about 10% 10 of last drink locations, between the two at least, and, uh, and, and so, um, uh, the, the story there is that throughout the region, we've seen a mild increase in drunk driving that's led to a inconsistent trend in crashes, but within the last year at least, uh, higher than normal drunk driving crashes, of which PPC has probably a small.
percentage of it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it just might be worth you know reviewing the um, um, whatever policies are in place for uh, for drinking at the at the casino and uh, ensuring the drunk drivers don't leave the location. Do you, this is more my own personal curiosity. Sure. Does Plainville and the surrounding communities do they um, do patrons rely on ride shares? Yeah, that that one I can't answer you unfortunately. I, I don't know. We have good data on that anywhere. Yeah, we're, of course I'm looking right to the chief. Yeah. He's shaking his head. Yes, okay. um, they do rely on ride shares. Uh, it, so it's consistent with the rest of the Commonwealth, right? Or probably the rest of the country. I have been waiting for eagerly for a couple of years for national studies to come out mm -hmm. to, to evaluate the impact of ride shares yeah. on drunk driving because mm -hmm. you, you would think it would have a fairly significant impact, but I, I'm not aware of any yet, and I'm especially not aware of any localized to, um, to this region. But yeah, that, that definitely, I'll look for that um, in, in, in future reports. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, funny, it's not funny, but it, it, it's, it's kind of amusing statistically that in the midst of a, a time that we had a decrease, in, such a decrease in burglaries in the area, we also had a, a burglary pattern. Uh, and the only one that I'm aware of in which the offender could clearly be shown to have a casino motivation. So it's, it's, a, it's a reminder that you can have these patterns even in the midst of big decreases in crime, and they might not therefore show up. If, you, if we're just looking at, at the numbers. Uh, and uh, as you can see from the, ch the table here, it doesn't really even involve, except for Rentham, uh, most of the surrounding communities. But th this guy um, was arrested ultimately twice uh, for this, uh, this pattern. And you can see that the first five or, or six of them, he didn't get anything out of it. He didn't steal anything. Uh, he tried to break into the house, but he got scared away, or um, the dog scared him away, or, or something like that. And so finally, in the, in the one, um, after he's been doing this a week in Rentham on uh, October 8th to, to 9th, uh, he got $250 from a wallet, which he immediately took to Plain Ridge Park. Uh, he was identified as a suspicious activity there. Uh, and. Um, and identified as intoxicated, actually. He drove away, and the state police ended up charging him for, uh, for drunk driving. Uh, but then later on, he got arrested for the, um, the burglaries as well, uh, which he committed a, another one after, after leaving Plain Ridge Park on the, on the 11th. Uh, anyway, he specifically cited after his arrest that he was motivated to steal, look for cash uh, for, for gambling. So that's, that's the one case that we're, we're aware of. Uh, that I'm aware of, at least, in, in which that happens. One case I've been told about, in which that has been a clear uh, motivation in the midst of a crime that has experienced 50% decreases in the region. So. Mm. Well, Christopher, so the, the, I want to make sure I understand this slide. Yeah. This is the same individual? Mm -hmm. Yes. If at all these different all, yeah. days and times? Yes. Well, as best as we can figure, anyway, from the modus operandi, the suspect description, and what he admitted to after the, the crime was committed. Um, I'd have to go back and look at my notes to see how sure I am about all of the individual ones, but I, I'm 90% sure thing. of the entire series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he attempted seven burglaries, and he was successful well, five at least, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Before he was five. Oh, you're, oh, total, yeah. Total seven in which he was only successful once. Yes, so he's yeah. he's not the best burglar. No, he, he amassed enough charges to put himself away for about 20 years and got $250 for it. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So the summary here uh, is that um, we've had no increase, and in fact, we've had significant decreases in the classic profit-motivated predatory crimes like robbery, burglary, and auto theft. The violent crime increase doesn't seem to be related to Plain Ridge Park. Neither do the fraud and identity theft increases. We've seen a mild increase in, in visitor-driven crimes, uh, not crimes, calls for service like lost property, suspicious activity and traffic complaints, a mild increase in traffic collisions, in minor traffic collisions specifically. And as I said earlier, this is all part of a, a larger pattern of economic growth and traffic growth in the area from which Plain Ridge Park is going to be harder and harder to extract individually as the, uh, the years go forward. Shall I take any questions on Plain Ridge Park before I move on to MGM? Um, I, I, I think your um, comment about um, the drunk driving uh, charges as a result of a crash are interesting and probably something we do need to follow up on, put a meeting together and, and follow up on that. Because 
crash data is reliable because there's not a, it doesn't matter if there's a detail out there. Right. It's a crash. Right, exactly. Yes. So, it, it's not dependent on police activity. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and prior to, you know, uh, um, so we encouraged agencies to adopt methods for recording what incidents they knew were specifically related to Plain Ridge Park. Mm -hmm. Only Attleboro really instituted something formalized within their records management system, and they don't have it anymore because they switched record systems uh, last year. But during the period in which they had that, the only times that that, that box was checked w was for a couple of drunk driving incidents in which the person said they were uh, last leaving Plain Ridge Park. So we'd had that little bit of evidence prior to it, but uh, it, it, we didn't really have better statistics un until now. I'm going to try to collect that from the other agencies, though, um, going forward, because the ABCC data has to wait for adjudication, which takes a while. Uh, so I want to see if we can get data from the, the local agencies, too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, MGM. If I, uh, oh, Christopher, sorry. just one last uh, comment. So we, this uh, report at this point is considered preliminary because we haven't, the, the comment period hasn't closed yet, but um, in order to, to move this forward as quickly as we possibly could, we were comfortable enough with the data even as is um, that we felt it was appropriate to, to share publicly. Um, but the, the comment period will, will, will give it a couple more weeks before it would be considered final. But we did have the pre-meeting with the chiefs and... Yeah, I just didn't have all the numbers correct. at the time. Yeah. We didn't have everything, but we, you had the basic... Gist. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, just to acknowledge uh, Chief Alfred from the Plainville um, mm -hmm. Police Department, and we've been doing this for four or five years now, and Chief Alfred has been there at every meeting um, and, and been a... Uh, really welcome participant to this process and really helpful to um, to this particular study. So thank you. Actually, Chief, if I would jump on that bandwagon there, not only has he been an active participant, but because the chief was willing to go out on, I, I won't say a limb, but he was willing to work collaboratively with the state police right out of the box, which then made it possible and probable for the other chiefs in both Springfield and their surrounding communities and Everett and there, and, and I know how many calls you've gotten, hey, how's it working out? Because it's it's not something that's done readily. Um, so I, I think that that's really been so helpful with uh, the implementation of, of gaming, the fact that you were willing, Chief, to to take that chance and, and say, yes, I'll sign an MOU, yes. I'll work together, and because that was a successful endeavor, the others um, were much more willing to come on board. So I do want to thank you for that as well. All right. Um, so obviously MGM uh, opens uh, in a very different geography uh, from Plain Ridge Park. It, it opens in an area that uh, has a lot higher population, of course, and historically uh, much higher crime and call for service totals. Uh, so because of that, you know, different analytical methods are really necessary to extract its, um, its influence from the surrounding area. In particular, there's the issue of geography. Um, you know, where, it's, where MGM is right there on a, on a street that you can, you can walk right to the casino, you can park nearby and, and get to the casino, you can tr take a, a bus, you can ride up on Amtrak, you know, it, it's, it's a lot different from Plain Ridge Park, which exists in its sort of isolated uh, own uh, space there, and, and you're, you're not, things aren't spilling out of Plain Ridge Park to, to the surrounding community the way they could, theoretically, at, um, at MGM. Uh, so uh, you're going to see in the future a lot more, I think, finite geographic analysis of what's happening uh, around MGM. I, did, I don't have a lot in this report just because it's only been eight months. So you know, once we have a year's worth of data, I think I, can, I have enough to do more with. Uh, it's also notable that, um, um, well, I'll start with the major findings. Uh, so over the, the, the eight months after um, MGM opened, uh, all crimes uh, were well below average um, during uh, across all of the uh, the communities that participated. They had been going down uh, in the region anyway uh, for, for about seven years, so um, that, that wasn't terribly surprising. Uh, the casino, if we just take what happens there and assume that it wouldn't have happened without it, 
uh, it, it led to a 2% increase in violent crime, a 2% increase in property crime, and a 2% increase in total crime, 1% increase in calls for service in Springfield Police Department's uh, own statistics, which, which isn't a terribly high you know, uh, se series of numbers. Uh, of course, Springfield's a big city. They've got a lot of other things uh, going on. It was the, the top location for crime and calls for service uh, during the region, but its percentage contribution wasn't, wasn't all that high. And the only things I, I found uh, in the eight, in eight months anyway that I thought were likely related to MGM um, were again increases in collisions and traffic related calls like disabled vehicles, uh, like uh, traffic complaints. They were mostly to the south and um, west of the casino in, in Agawam and West Springfield. Um, Again, more volume-related stuff, general service calls, things like uh, escorts, lockouts, um, you know, other kinds of public assist calls, uh, as well as lost property. Union Station in particular saw a big increase, and I know it wasn't open you know, for many years prior to, to this, but it, it saw an increase even above what was happening at the, the previous bus and train terminals. Uh, that, that were being used in, in the city. Uh, and I think the, the extra volume coming to the casino might have a lot to do with that. Uh, and then just across the bridges uh, in West Springfield, we saw some patterns of disorderly conduct and suspicious activity um, at a couple of the shopping strips um, over the bridge. Um, some hand-handling uh, complaints uh, in that same area. So um, th that was the only obvious geographic impact, but we'll talk about some other possibilities as, as I go forward here. As you can see from this chart, uh, property crime, violent crime, uh, and, um, and property crime and violent crime were already decreasing. Violent crime sort of bouncing around a uh, historic low uh, just before the casino opened. Property crime still shooting downward. And traffic collisions were up uh, in the area uh, before the, the casino opened. When it opened, it really the impact was not detectable uh, if you were looking at, at overall crime statistics for the region. You can see that dotted line uh, represents what would have happened with um, with crime, all crimes, is all, all, total crime. Uh, that dotted line represents what would have happened if MGM hadn't opened and the thick black line is what actually happened. Uh, they're virtually on top of each other and, and you really don't see much variance. When we look at crashes, this is by street segment. I've got to get a better G, G, a map of these street segments to, uh, so I can a aggregate them better. But the, it's, it still tells the story. Right around the casino, obviously, with all the extra traffic, we saw, we saw an increase uh, in crashes. Um, it, the, as we get farther away from the casino, the specific, its specific contribution becomes less obvious. But if you look over in, in Agawam and, and West Springfield, you see some of the streets that showing an increase are on feeder routes to the bridges uh, heading over to the casino. I think obviously what's happening here is, is on the, the east side of the river and north of the casino, people are just coming in off the highway a lot more, so uh, it's not affecting the, the local routes except exact, specifically right around MGM where they, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of congestion naturally. But from the south and west, they're not necessarily taking uh, highways up, and so uh, we're seeing more th local traffic through Agawam and West Springfield. That's my hypothesis at this point anyway. Obviously, we'll have to wait for traffic studies to know for sure. Uh, what's happening there? Um, and here, here's the map of suspicious activity calls, and um, in West Springfield, as we can see, we th th there's a shopping center. Uh, you guys can't see me pointing. <laughs> well, there's a shopping center uh, in that southern area uh, in West Springfield. I, it, its name escapes me. I, I want. I, I can't. I had it wrong when we were at the meeting, too, and I can't, can't remember what they corrected me. But anyway, there, there's a lot of stores there. Uh, restaurants, uh, a couple of big box stores. Uh, uh, River, Riverdale? Yes. Riverdale. No, that might be a different one. I, I keep getting two or three confused. It's possible you're right. Um, Where are you pointing? Riverdale, I, this lower area here. Yeah, okay. I have it in the report itself, obviously, but I, I didn't mark it on the map in... in uh, in text. Uh, but in any event, there's a lot of stores in there, and we're seeing a lot more calls for people hanging out in front of the stores, suspicious activity, panhandling, and so forth. Where it's it's so geographically close, I think it's at least worth considering that it might be related. But we don't have we don't have direct evidence from the people themselves saying, "Yeah, I'm only here because of the uh, 
of the casino. Now, this is an interesting story. Um, maybe I, I made the discontinued a little bit too big there, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> really put that in your face. Didn't you got your point across. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but during the first four months, we saw an, uh, an increase in thefts from vehicles and uh, from re re mostly residential driveways. Um, and also thefts of property from residences uh, like bicycles in the yard and so forth, uh, stretching south and east from MGM uh, and into East Longmeadow and, and Longmeadow. And that went away during the second four month period. Um, now, that type of pattern isn't terribly uncommon for the region, um, but talking with the chiefs, you know, they thought there was a reasonable chance that. Uh, that the casino was having something to do with it, the extra activity caused by the casino. Uh, but what they did, was they, they effectively responded to it. So the Longmeadow Police Department told us specifically that they established a DDAX zone in the northern part of the city there. DDAX stands for Data Driven Approaches to Crime and Traffic Safety. It's a method of hotspot policing. It's a, another project that I happen to be involved with, so it's kind of funny to see them come together. Uh, at this place, but I, the, the Longmeadow chief said that he established a zone up there and put extra patrol officers in that region, uh, and, um, and Springfield also said that they had, had reacted to this analysis by putting uh, extra patrols at various times in, in that region to the south and east. I don't believe, I'm not sure if East Longmeadow was at that meeting, so I don't believe we heard anything specific from them about what they were doing, but I, it's potentially a pretty good example of the, this report st uh, prompting some police strategy that then ended the pattern that um, that the report had identified. I like to think so anyway. So you know we'd have to do more of a case study on it to to, to prove that. But uh, uh, that was the feedback we got from the meeting anyway. Uh, and this was another pattern that was discontinued. We saw some during the first four months after the casino an increase in purse uh, thefts and purse snatching along this Riverdale uh, Street section of West Springfield. Uh, but there were, only, there were five of them, only five, and it didn't continue after the first four months. So we never really found out for sure what was motivating that particular trend. As I said, geographically, I, I want to do a lot more analysis now once we have a year's worth of data. For this report, I did three geographies. One, uh, the MGM block, so the, the literal block surrounding the casino, uh, then the metro center in general, and then the surrounding neighborhoods of Springfield. And the only thing that had increased on the, the block right around the casino were, was disorderly conduct uh, calls for service. Did, In the metro did, center. Um, can I just ask this question? Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing references to, you know, drunken driving, and then I see something like disorderly conduct. Yeah. But uh, is there any connection to opioid abuse? Have you? That's not being. We haven't really seen anything in, in, involving an increase in drug activity uh, in in any of the uh, the casino regions so far. Um, now that's heavily dependent on police uh, activity and you know, what they what they focus on and how many investigative resources they apply. So uh, it, it's really tough to get data on actual usage without using, like, say, self-report surveys of, of people in the region. Um, but so far, no, we haven't, we haven't seen any evidence, yeah, it, seen not even reflected in, say, you know, crashes or in, reflected in causal factors uh, of any crimes. It, it, no, it, that hasn't been a, uh, a theme so far. I wonder if it's part of the health, um, if there are calls for medical care not well, connected would, to we, we do have um, we, we, we do have from a certain number of agencies uh, they'll they'll they code overdoses at least right um, you, you know which is what you're talking about mm -hmm. I, I think with me medical calls that are related to, to drugs um, but even in those we haven't seen much of an increase now I would caution that a, a lot of communities didn't start recording those consistently until about two or three years ago so we don't have much of a baseline uh, to do the comparison to but in the ones that that have had that historic baseline we still haven't seen it, much of an increase uh, the, the opioid epidemic though is something that the it started in the in, you know in the um, before this decade I'm right sure. in, in um, mid 2005 2006 2007 so in in any of the period in which, for which we have baseline statistics we were already in in the middle of it uh, it's it's not something that i, I don't think uh, chief alfred might have a different opinion so i'd like to, to get it but i don't think it, it's gotten particularly worse in the last five years do you think chief no we've seen, we've seen it increase yeah. already, so. but 
decrease. Decrease. Yeah. And I, I don't know how well they've applied to the local area, but there have been some effective national strategies in, in dealing with, uh, with opioid uh, abuse. And a lot of law enforcement agencies, too, are starting to see it more as a, you know, a health issue rather than a, an, an enforcement issue. So that's changing the way that they respond and record uh, numbers for those types of crimes, too. Yeah. yeah we've had some large changes, so we don't charge necessarily when we're at the scene. Right. So mm -hmm. that would throw those numbers off. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Chief. Very helpful. Thank no you. Uh, so I, I noted on this map and, and in the report some statistics that had gone up and down in those three geographies. I don't want to make too much of any of them because um, none of them were during the summer. So th this was a period that ended in April, uh, obviously before the height of, of what would be, say, pedestrian season in the area. So when I collect the, the one-year data, that's going to be much more meaningful uh, in the analysis of what happened geographically around around the casino. Uh, at the same time, then I'll also be analyzing what happened in the surrounding communities around their exit radiuses, which I've already mapped. But I, I wanted to see if, if traffic to and from the casino caused an increase at, say, restaurants or um, uh, gas stations, uh, other places that people would use facilities uh, in, in the immediate area. And, and so I've got those geographies mapped. They were just waiting for a big enough data set to make any sense to, to fuel it. So I'll have more on that next time. But I, I don't want to make too much of it this time, except to say a, a number of crimes have decreased in, in, in the Metro Center uh, around the casino. And, and I think that there's a really good chance that long term, all of the extra law enforcement presence, as well as the legitimate traffic in the area, uh, will continue to drive down some crimes while maybe increasing some others. Um, you know, you, you have competing things happening, basically. You have a, a much larger population of people in the area, which, you know, classically might increase the number of victimizations, but you've also, also creates a situation where people are acting as mutual guardians for each other, and thus drives down uh, certain crimes. Uh, some other notes uh, we've seen, just I don't want anybody to get alarmed that so many of the communities have seen increases in pornography. Uh, of course, there isn't much in the way of pornography anymore that's illegal except for uh, for child pornography. Uh, and most of what we're seeing in the region, even though the, the numbers are going up, it, is not uh, classic predatory child pornography, but teenagers taking images of each other and sharing them around and, uh, and causing you know, little mini scandals at their schools and so forth, which I don't want to minimize that, but it's, it's not anything that's related to MGM or um, it, it's definitely its own special uh, thing. Just like Plainville, we're seeing an increase in domestic violence and domestic disputes disputes in the area in some communities, only three of the 11. So again, that's not really enough to establish a huge trend out of, um, but we'll keep monitoring that. Um, overall arrests are within the expected range. And so far, I haven't seen any changes at the types of locations that I thought might go up, like gas stations, hotels, and restaurants. Uh, the last drink data, you know, obviously isn't complete for uh, for the time period that it's been open, but we'll have it for future reports. Amtrak, I'm curious what ha what's happening on the lines going up to, um, to Union Station, and if they're seeing an increase, they expressed willingness to participate, but otherwise haven't provided the data just yet. Um, and I also want to get some more statistics on traffic volume so I can better establish the relationship between uh, certain traffic-related calls for service and uh, and you know whether or not that it's truly re related to the extra volume in the area. So that's all coming soon. Any questions on that? So finally, I, I'll just talk briefly about Encore. There's not really much to say since 
Uh, oh, well, I had a little slide. Yeah, we'll skip that. We talked about it. Uh, Encore, there isn't much to say because, uh, you know, it's just a, a baseline that we've done there, and, and no, there's no, no changes to report just yet. Um, obviously, we've just passed the period in which I can now collect uh, four-month data for, for Encore. Uh, I'll give the agencies a month or so to get you know, their, their coding in order before... I do it, but we'll see, see a report towards the end of the year, the beginning of next. Uh, these are the Encore participating agencies, and uh, Cambridge is the one that, that just said no on providing the, the data uh, at all. Uh, a little bit personally embarrassing, since I was the crime analyst there for, for seven years. Um, but <laughs> things have, uh, Maybe we can work th on that. Things Maybe have changed can, politically. And, Maybe we uh, can ask, you know, kind of just find out what the issues it are. It might be worth it, sure, call. going back. They're the only agency that has a legal advisor full-time, and uh, I find, you know, whenever that that position exists, they tend to be a little bit more cautious about uh, you, you can almost never go wrong by not not providing data, and, you know, but then when you do, the, uh, you know, things appear in the newspaper and so forth, so. And, I, and, and how did you approach the each participant? How did uh, did you get them to? Well, we started by having a regional meeting the regional of, of all of the local, local chiefs, and I like to think I have you know good contacts in this area from my previous work. I also am you know have been heavily involved in the crime analysis community in this area, unlike the, the previous tool. Uh, Springfield has an excellent crime analysis unit, uh, but none of the surrounding agencies do. Here, almost everybody does. Everett, Chelsea, Revere, Malden, uh, Somerville, uh, Cambridge, uh, Medford lost one, but I think they're going to get a new one. Lynn does. So uh, it, it's been a lot. It's ultimately going to be easier to work with these communities because of that. Um, but in this particular case, so we, we invited them. We had a meeting. Most everybody seemed to agree to participate at the meeting. Uh, but when it came to getting the specific data set, is when we. Uh, now I, I will say to Cambridge's credit, they offered to send me numbers. Um, that's to an analyst. That's about as close as you can get to a middle finger, basically. Oh. So, you know, uh, so I, I said, no, I don't. I don't want summary data. Uh, I, I need specific data. But anyway, uh, Medford uh, did not it was not able to contribute data for this particular study. It's, but they're willing to do it. That we just, I don't know. We just had problems with the logistics. So that that'll come for the next report. Well, we were successful in getting Foxborough to get on board yeah, eventually. Fox. So maybe we can you know, try that again with Cambridge as well. And, and Christopher, there was a discussion about including Saugus. Um, right. It, yeah, we did it's talk. not a designated surrounding community, but it's a, it's a hole in, yeah. um, in the map. And so uh, that, that could be on our, our list of to-dos. Sure, we can, we can give them a call. Um, Boston was uh, surprisingly easy to work with. I, uh, I had a great experience with them, although they didn't give me a direct access to their database the way that other communities did. They, they provided what I needed. And just for the Char Charleston uh, neighborhood, I, I felt that the entirety of Boston would, would be just too much data to, uh, it would overwhelm the region and right. you know, we wouldn't be able to identify uh, some trends within it. But they gave me Charlestown and they gave me um, selected uh, reporting areas in the seaport area so that w where there's water taxis that are going to the casino so we can see if that has any, any, any increase as well. Can, um, can, can we go back to the surrounding communities for a minute yeah. here? The conversation about Saugus, for example. Yeah. Um, so what we did when we started this project is um, initially, uh, surrounding communities really s uh, obviously the easy ones were um, uh, you know there's a border to they border the host community city or town now other communities uh, applied right and said look I really believe I'll have impacts and these are the reasons why and we were able to designate them as surrounding communities um, Saugus did not self-identify or apply to become a surrounding community, which is why they're not included. But for this purpose, it doesn't mean we can't go back to them and say, hey, we'd love to have you participate in this project. Yeah. I, I think we should do that because they, obviously with Route 1 cutting right through the middle of the town and mm -hmm. so many restaurants and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's a mall there, obviously, so many facilities on that major travel route. I, I, I think that they'd, okay. they'd be more likely that, than um, even, say, Revere, which is geographically closer but has less uh, of that, that key travel real estate uh, to, to experience uh, much activity. Okay, well, we'll definitely make that contact mm -hmm. then. Um, so 
and I, I believe they they use the same record system as some of these other ones, so it, it won't be that hard to to get data if they agree to participate. So the, the the data I did collect was from eight agencies from January 1st, 2012, area population of 430,000, and we had about 300,000 uh, crimes and about 2.3 million calls for service among the data. Um, you know, a huge part of doing the baseline part is just setting things up for further analysis, and a big part of that is the geography. Uh, how many dots can I, what percentage of dots can I get on the map from the addresses that have been supplied? And I, I got almost 90%, and, and I can keep chipping away at that. So that, that was good. I, I was expecting it to be lower, and it, the mapping part to be much more annoying here. Um, also, it's worth noting that the state police uh, tra uh, patrol much more territory in this region and many more of the local routes than they do in both the Plainville and the Springfield areas. So um, you're going in, to, in Springfield, you know, all state police statistics for the highways and that's about it. But around here, Memorial Drive, uh, Storo Drive, uh, route, uh, Revere Beach Parkway, I mean, there's a lot of local routes that, that have a high state police presence and collect a lot of state, uh, where the state police is the primary reporting agency for those crashes. Um, you can see some of them on this chart here. So we'll be working a, a lot more with state police data uh, in assessing the impacts here, because naturally the Encore is just off of uh, mm -hmm. Route 16. Um, as, as for this immediate surrounding geography, it, it's interesting how, how different a challenge the three casinos have posed, uh, because you know, Encore, although it's, it, it is, in terms of the city itself, in the mid middle of a fairly busy area that, that has a lot of activity going on, the specific block on which the casino was built was just an industrial area that had virtually you know, no activity uh, in the past. You can see here, uh, just to, with just 2018, and just a selection of crimes, uh, but there's, a, uh, you know, there's some across the road there. There's this mixed residential commercial area on the other side of, um, of Route 99, uh, that had a, a little bit of activity, but generally, sp and, and then on the other side of the casino, uh, to the west, there's a, a major um, shopping center that you can't easily get to from Encore. You've got to go back up to 16 and then over and then down. But, uh, you know, a little bit of activity in both of those places, but generally speaking, it, it, that region, that that block, anyway, that series of blocks hasn't had much in the past. So uh, it'll be easier to detect new activity there. Uh, but then as far as going beyond that into the surrounding region, you're suddenly hitting an area that has, that's just very dense. It's very, you know, very dense ur uh, urban concentration uh, that's got a lot of existing activity and it's going to be harder to thread out the, the Encore involved activity specifically from it. So it's a challenge. I, you know, enjoy that kind of challenge. Uh, if that footbridge ever gets completed, uh, there's, of course, you've got the um, Assembly Square area. I couldn't remember the name. Uh, on the other side of the uh, of the river there, that uh, has you know gone through so much revitalization in the last few years and uh, has a lot of things to attract uh, casino visitors. Uh, so we might see you know an increase in, in activity in that area uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So each one has very very different urban geography and is going to lead to different methods of analyzing what happens there. I just threw in one map, this one, I, there's like four or five in the, in the actual report. I, in the presentation, I just put in this one map of thefts from vehicles just to show, you know, I, I did collect uh, you know, geographic data, was able to map it, was able to identify hotspots. So, so you can see existing hotspots in, you know, uh, in Charlestown there, in, in downtown Chelsea, in downtown Lynn, a little bit in Everett, but the, the area where the casino is, uh, you know, it, it isn't a hot spot at all currently and for almost any crime. So we'll be able to see if that geography changes. Again, that's you know, there's a lot of stats in the in the book that show the numbers that you would expect annually uh, for for each of the communities. Uh, obviously, we'll be starting with a four month period, just like we did with Springfield, doing an eight month, one year, and then we'll we'll see after that. And I suppose uh, my summary is that yeah, there was some data collection, a few data collection issues, um, more state police presence on local roads, different geographic patterns. Oh, and yeah, there's much more in the way of transportation that we have to look at here. I'm trying to get MBTA to participate as well, because they have their own police department, as you know, and that, that deals with stuff happening on the train, in the stations, and in the lots. Uh, and so that's going to be important to analyze if they'll, if they'll come aboard. But um, 
there's a lot more ways to get to Encore than there is just the other casinos so far. And so we have to look at those transportation patterns and what happens around the depots for those, uh, that transportation. Any other questions for me? Uh, no, excellent work as always. And um, we'll keep the chiefs in, engaged and make sure we can make this, uh, continue to make this project worthwhile. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, the only question I had about oh, the Boston data, yeah. given, um, I mean, it's not a, an easy walk, but in decent weather, if people were to go over the bridge through East Cambridge and dump themselves down to the Fleet Center, is there any thought to whether you think there's gonna be an impact in that area in terms of getting specifics? Well, in talking with the, with the Boston police, um, you know, they didn't seem to think so, but okay. I, you're right, it might be worth taking a look at that. Um, it, the, I'm sure the data extracts they're using to give me the data that I requested could just be expanded to pick up a few additional reporting areas. So yeah, if that's a concern, I'll definitely ask them to do that. Okay. okay. It is quite, it would be quite a bit of a walk, but, yeah. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> I mean, certainly we're looking at Lynn, which I, doesn't even, it isn't even on any major travel routes. And, and uh, so it, I'm making note to myself, but I'll, I'll get that additional data. This is great. I, uh, I really look forward to, um, as we now have the three on the way, we're able to, you're able to, you know, glean some of the differences or similarities and um, because, yes, they sit in different geographies, uh, uh, but uh, we, we are, of course, interested in, you know, protecting all of the, them equally. And so, again, to the extent we can get some of those uh, trends, um, that would be really helpful. There's obviously going to be a place in you know a couple of years for a, a macro level report that that an, you know asks some big questions about the impacts of casinos generically once we have multiple years of data from each um, each casino. But uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see all the variances and and not just obviously in the geography but also in the type of facility too mm -hmm. and uh, and what they offer and and how many patrons they get and so forth. Right. Thank One last you. question. Oh, I sure. know it's uh, late in the afternoon. Um, is there anything that you can identify through your work that we could be doing, should be doing, that we're not right now? You're talking about you uh, as a commission yeah. or no, as? No, 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 no. Oh. As for your work, yeah. and you have a contract to do X, Y, and Z with us. Uh, yes. Or is there anything you've because you've been doing this now for a few years, is there anything you think we're missing or could add value to the work you do? Well, one, one big thing, I guess, is that I, I need to work to get better data on, on what's happening at the casino specifically. Okay. Um, I'm mostly getting uh, summary statistics from the Gaming Enforcement Unit, uh, which, um, I can't analyze it in the same detail as I can analyze what I get from the, the, the police departments. Some of that data is duplicated by what's in the state police record system, RAMS, mm -hmm. uh, but enough isn't that I, I need to do a better job trying to figure out why uh, and, and what, the, what the difference is between what's in RAMS and what's not in, in RAMS. Uh, now, I understand there, there, at least some of the casino, I don't know if this is universally true at all of them. So, well, I understand the GEU is, is using a different database to collect mm -hmm. data than they did in the past. Lieutenant Connor was telling me about this. I haven't really had a chance to talk to him about exactly what what that looks like and whether I could then get better data uh, from it. Uh, but I mean, I was originally contracted just to analyze the surrounding area. I included some statistics from the casino, uh, you know, just because to make a com more complete picture. But since so many of the questions I get are about yeah. that specifically, I want to be able to answer them better. Okay. And that's also going to include collecting data from other casinos nationally so I can we can better sense of, you know, do any of ours have a unique problem okay. with a particular crime or is that just what we'd expect given that overall volume? Great. Yeah. Why don't we set up a call with uh, Detective Lieutenant Connors just to talk yeah. about um, um, what's happening at the casinos and if there's a way we can improve the data that you're getting. We, we had talked early on about the possibility of tasking 
um, maybe a, a fusion center analyst for the state yes. police or something yes. to work with yes. uh, yeah, the casinos. And if, if that's still on the table, I, I think we should we should have that that conversation as well. And of course, we've talked also about the whole uh, issue of, of human trafficking and, and how hard it is to measure that um, with, with police statistics. But we're talking about setting up a meeting with we some are. experts on that. We, yeah. we are. We are. In fact, we're back on that now, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll be contacting you soon. Yeah. With uh, with a date to do that, and we'll we'll also set up a separate call with uh, uh, Detective Lieutenant uh, Connors just to talk about what we could do differently, and if a, a body at the Fusion Center, we'll f we'll figure that piece okay. out. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, that's the only things I can think of. But if you were had a mm -hmm. specific thing in mind, I'd, I'd obviously no, welcome the suggestion. No, I just you're okay. You're doing the work, and sometimes you see things yeah. that you didn't anticipate, or we didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. And if I just uh, I recall back when we had um, the early hearings at the commission and the three primary concerns that communities approached us with were traffic, um, crime, and problem gambling. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was that, that very uh, explicit charge to take a look at what the, what the crime impacts are in, in, in or around the uh, casino, not necessarily in, but it does seem like a natural sort of uh, progression to begin looking at the whole picture, um, the whole picture, including mm -hmm. what's happening in the casino. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Moving on to item eight, commissioner updates. Do we have any updates? I have a quick one to get out just before we uh, reach our allotted time. Uh, our friends at the National Center for Trades Women or the Northeast Center for Trade Women's Equity uh, shared an email with me and others uh, earlier this week and it said that women in Massachusetts now represent 9.2% of apprenticeships and union programs, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because that figure leads the country mm -hmm. and the national average still only remains around two to 3%. So mm -hmm. kudos to our colleagues and the great work that they're doing and, and our team, Elaine and Jill and Crystal who have focused on the uh, Build the Life campaign, but that's mm -hmm. a pretty impressive number. Very yeah. impressive. Mm. Any other updates? With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> Five zero. Thank you.